Doesn't it feel so much more official when we, when we play the intro live? Feels nice. Yeah. Really gets you into it. Uh, welcome everyone back to Disassembled, the official podcast of the Big Glasgow Comic Page. You're getting that pronunciation. I'm trying. Nope. I'm Milk trying to... Glasgow. <laughs> welcome to Glasgow. Um, there you go. No bad. Not bad. Really? That yeah. That was that, yeah. okay. Play it. <laughs> I was I was intentionally being whatever. As <laughs> with every week, I'm your strangely american host ian lynn and this week we're joined by massimo the machine i'm back baby and of course a favored son of the podcast lovely daniel it's good to be back i, I always i feel well, I like away, I, but <laughs> we missed you last week uh, I, yeah. I feel like uh I feel like I tend to go back and forth between saying everyone's last name and not saying everyone's last name. And I should probably pick a lane and stick to it. But I like to keep people on their toes. Doesn't bother me. You call me up in Cold Wars. It's all right. I was going to say, yeah, definitely. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Honestly, I think I'm just still uh, scared of screwing up Massimo's name again. I've right? got personal yeah. trauma from the time I called him Massimo <laughs> Castillo. Well, that got edited out as well. You edited yourself in a better position, but... Um... So it's a wee behind the scenes exclusive there that you messed up my name on first time of asking. Yes, I called him Massimo Castillo and I immediately, that's why I correct myself after I make a mistake so I can go in after the fact, give myself a pause, say the right thing, and then I just, I sneak in after the fact. And I, yeah. yeah. Cut behind that the scenes, shit out. folks. So behind, does it sound like you're referring to a pizza place and you're referring yes, to a co-host? Yes, and then Daniel gets the video <laughs> and he's like, I'm leaving that all in. BGCP <laughs> uncut, baby! <laughs> Uh, for the record, that is the difference. Uh, YouTube generally less edited because video is we like the edits I do. It's a, a lot of it is to shorten the awkward silences and stuff. And that, those kind of small edits are a lot more jarring in video. I think um, I really, I really hate YouTube videos where they are just constant. You can tell they're cutting from they record like ten seconds of them saying something and they cut, and then they record their next line cut. I, I hate that. This is yeah. unrelated to anything. Anyways, uh, you know, it, speaking of YouTube, if what would be really cool uh, for you, the viewer or listener, to do on YouTube would be to perhaps like this video and maybe subscribe if you haven't done that yet, because we would like that if you did that. Smash that bell to uh, get notifications when the videos uh, of the podcast got smash. That's me smash. Smash. Right? Must smash. smash like Khabib Nurmagomedov. Nur- 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 yeah, right, okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's, not get, that's not getting kept on. This is so, it. We have to good job around uh, this. this is, so we're, we have a, a great uh, cocktail of, of bullshit for you this week because I'm starting to get um, a little under the weather and uh, Daniel's like half drunk and Massimo wasn't even going to be on until about 20 minutes ago. So this is going to be great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yep. 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 So this week, we are going to hit a couple of reviews from the site this week, just so that the audience, if they don't visit the site very often, kind of know what we do there. We're going to go through a couple of things we've been watching or reading this week, our four-year consideration. Uh, We'll go through news. We're going to talk about the Invincible finale. There's a lot to unpack there. And we're going to go through our weekly topic, which this week is favorite non-superhero comics now the way we're defining that no capes no flights no tights we might have some honorable mentions that technically exist in the big two universes but by and large we're going to stick to smaller imprints indie things that don't even exist in the same stratosphere as superheroes it's always a uh, great when you get called on last minute and you have to scramble to find several uh, non-superhero related comic books you did uh, it so, I did it, yeah. Massimo Castelli works well under pressure. The exactly. machine! We call him that machine. for a reason. Cold, calm, collected, calculated. Yes, exactly. He might be a sociopath. Who knows? Or a serial killer. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Could be. And someday this will be. This podcast will be used in a court of law. Woo! Like, I'm definitely or not. Or a Netflix I, documentary. I was saying I definitely wasn't the dirtiest member of, uh, of the BGCP group at one point. <laughs> for... We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> <clears throat> um, 
So anyways, review roundup. I'm just going to go through some of the reviews on the website. In case you didn't know, the big Glasgow, con- Glasgow? Glasgow? The BGCP, <laughs> the GlasgowComicPage.com, is home to reviews, interviews, news, none of which are written by me these days because I'm a lazy asshole. But you know what? We have a bunch of great writers on the website that may not appear on the podcast, so I, I want to give them a shout out. Like I say, I think we need to also congratulate Daniel here as he is uh, surpassed his 100th uh, post on the website as a reviewer. Yeah, oh, look at me, Daniel, and I'm productive. I should, I should have got party poppers, but I'm a waste of um, No, um, yeah, I heard a post and I wrote uh, my first opinion piece where I went in on YouTube changes. And it's, and yeah, it's, pretty, and it's pretty good. It got, done surprisingly some... well. Because I actually asked Dean beforehand, I was like, I think I've got a plan for my 100th post. I was going to do something daft, and then I read about that, and that kind of pissed me off. So I was like, no, I'm going to do something on that. And I went to Ian, and I said, is this okay for the site? And he was like, all right, mate, just make it a bit clickbait so it gets actual clicks, because it's quite a hard read. But no, <laughs> it it's actually clicks. done... Yeah, and, I didn't uh, even share it that much, and it done quite yeah. well. So I mean, cheers. I was going to say like it did. I was looking at it, and it's just a really good like opinion piece, and has some really good information and kind of interesting stuff about YouTube, uh, especially for up and coming kind of creators changes and stuff, and how that's going to affect people. Also, full disclosure, it was like four thousand words long, and yeah. I, and I just absolutely trimmed it to hell. So it was like yeah, a thousand fine. and a half. But if, if you want to kind of. Uh, give a brief summation on that situation when we get to news that would be maybe sure interesting thing. for the Good, audience yeah. to hear um in so for the i only picked out a few of the reviews there there haven't actually been that many reviews on the site this week there are some books i expected to get reviewed that didn't um that i read which makes me feel like a slacker because i probably could have written a review but we'll get to that <laughs> uh we've got doctor who alternating currents uh, which looks like it's a Lady Doctor Who and David Tennant Doctor Who team up here. That was reviewed by Rachel Williams. And she gave it an overall score of four and a half stars out of five. Uh, seems like she was a pretty big fan. Lots of nostalgia, it looks like, based on her overall thoughts. So that sounds like one to pick up. I think that uh, Rachel, Ben, and Kirsty have been doing well with the reviews. Yeah. Yes. They've been uh, very active. Michael Kirstie, as well. Louise Miller. Uh, yeah, Michael's actually... consistent, though. No. Yeah. Actually, I mean, our next shout out here, she reviewed Bedtime Stories for Impressionable Children Annual Number One, which is a mouthful. Um, it's a title, though, that already has me interested. Looks like it's a black and white comic, not your typical superhero fare. She gave it four out of five stars and says it's a fun little comic collection of shorts that all work individually. Some are more brilliant than others, but as a gaggle put together into a collection, it's all apps, and most importantly, works. There you go. Uh, Glowing review. Yep. Next, we've got Andy McGregor reviewed The Zombie Game, which is a Kickstarter comic. He gave this one. There we go. He put the score before the gallery at the bottom. He gave this one four and a half out of five. Uh, his overall impression is with a subtle nod to Robert Kirkman. This was a good addition to the zombie franchise and the graphic novel that I could see myself revisiting in the future. So it's about as high praise as any. Uh, Daniel, you reviewed 2018's The Predator. I did. Yeah, I rewatched, I rewatched that one. You gave that one. Ooh. You gave that one. Uh, well, we don't have an overall rating for the movie reviews, but uh, you gave it two stars for story. One and a half stars for cinematography and two and a half stars for acting. Which you... I thought was generous. So a uh, good experience there all around, Daniel. Uh, enjoyable did, time. Did, you, did you guys see that film? Like, I, I, remember, I actually I liked that film. I remember when it was coming out, right? And I was like, oh, Shane Black, like the nice guys and Lethal Weapon and, you know, Kiss Iron Kiss, Man Bang 3. Bang. Yeah, well, don't talk about that one. <laughs> but although, for the most part, you know, he's, he's pretty solid. Um, and, and The Predator, obviously, one of the most kind of classic movie monsters ever. I'm like, oh my God, this is going to be brilliant. Um, went to see it and thought it was one of the worst things I've ever seen. Courtney Fun Laugh really enjoyed it. She came away saying that was great. It was so dumb, and she didn't have any like prior expectations. Whereas I think because I went in expecting greatness, it was kind of worse for me. I don't know. See, I mean, um, I I love the original Predator. Yeah, 
but I also liked Predator 2. Is that the one so Donnie Glover, yeah? Clearly yeah. my okay, so. bar is not set very high. See, predators film, as a good predators, I would say Predators is the most good Grace yeah. and um, Adrian, Bro- uh, Adrian Brody. Um, yeah, yeah weird uh, that's Adrian Brody. Yeah, that's um, that's a good. I enjoyed that film. Like yeah. it's like I always have hit and miss with these kind of like classic film franchises, such as you know your your aliens, your predators, your kind of monster films and stuff like that. So for me personally, like I don't have that much nostalgia for them, but I try and avoid the really terrible ones. Yeah, I I went through with a friend, and around Halloween last year we did a marathon watch and it was over the course of the month, but a marathon watch of every alien and every predator movie together in order of when they came out. That is peaks and troughs. So that would have started with the two best films of the franchise. Yes. Started with alien and aliens went to predator, predator Predator two, then alien three, then alien resurrection. And then maybe the bottom of the barrel for both franchises, which are, uh, AVP and AVP Requiem. Mm. Those movies are really bad. Yeah. Great game, by the way. Really? Yeah, yes. it was okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, uh, terrible movies, though. Yep. Um, and then, you know, Prometheus, Alien Covenant, um, Predator. Actually, Predators was before that because it was 2010. So Predators, Prometheus, Alien Covenant, and then The Predator. Um. Maybe that was why I liked the Predator is yeah. after seeing yeah. AVP and sitting through the it's like masturbatory yeah. navel gazing that is Prometheus. <laughs> yeah. Uh the Predator didn't seem that bad. <laughs> um we also got uh, Daniel, you reviewed Berserker number two, but that's actually something you want to talk about in for your consideration this week. So I'm gonna hold off on that one. And you also reviewed Cyberpunk 2077. You have my word number one also my, for your consideration this week. My so we'll mind's on, on fire, by well. the way. That, yes. Dan, I was on fire. Which, you Comics know what? Comics are terrified. Speaking of, for your consideration, this is my rebranding of what used to be Review Roundup because I, we're really not reviewing things necessarily when we talk about stuff we've read this week. Maybe we didn't read it all the way through. Maybe we're not done with it. Maybe we haven't fully formed our thoughts yet uh but i also got tired of just kind of trying to figure out a good way to be like what what have you been watching slash reading slash consuming with your brain uh so i thought for your consideration was a good middle ground a little bit inside baseball there uh so now that you guys have the name you can make us a theme song here we go that would be cool yeah i actually was planning to do some um digging in the license free section of mp3s on the internet this week and maybe add in some uh introductory music to the various segments maybe like an like a kind of oscar type song for the for your consideration like an yes, academy exactly. style of- for yeah. your consideration and the audience will know if i did that because they'll have already heard the music the at this music. point exactly yeah so. it's it's all out of uh, it's all out of the whack. I didn't Podcast find one magic. yet, or I would have just put it on the soundboard. But whatever, yeah. it's fine. Do uh, we have one of those now? J- yes, we have a soundboard. I play the intro live, and it really gets us going, and it's you know gets me feeling jazzed up. And then we talk about nothing for the first fifteen minutes of the podcast. It's great. <laughs> this is great. This is fantastic. Where, where are we at? We're at actually almost fifteen minutes. minutes and seconds, so. <laughs> um, perfectly timed. Um, so I'll start off for your consideration this week. The two biggest things I read that were brand new were Robin number one, uh, which is done by, give me just a second here because my memory for people is awful. I feel really bad too. Cause I shot off a short review on Twitter and the author actually uh, liked it. Uh, Joshua Williamson, Joshua Williamson did Robin number one, which I liked quite a bit. Uh, the Robin in Robin number one is Damian Wayne, who is very hit and miss for people and has been since Grant Morrison invented him back in 2006. Mm -hmm. Um, It's actually been quite a while since there was a Damian comic I liked. I think the last time I liked anything Damian was in was Super Sons back in the beginning of DC Rebirth, which obviously went out the window because Brian Michael Bendis came in and went, no more kid John Kent. We're going to age him up. 
because Brian Bendis do what Brian Bendis wants. Uh, but Robin number one, basically, it's setting up to be a kind of Enter the Dragon, Kumite, blood sports sort of thing. Uh, you've got Damien kind of going off on his own. He's out of falling out with his father because uh, he real mad about Alfred getting killed during Tom King's run of Batman. I think how long are they going to keep that up for? Sorry, I, just, I know that's like a big thing. How long is Alfred going to stay dead? I don't know. Not to drag it too far away, I like from the, the comic itself, but that's one of the things I was shocked that they managed to stick with since, you know, the middle. Yeah, of I thought for thing. sure they would undo that with uh, Infinite Frontier, but yeah, not yet. Maybe the next reboot. Yeah, maybe we'll stay dead. <laughs> maybe, I mean, maybe. Lol. No. <laughs> I call the catcher and kill someone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the only people that stayed dead in comics at this point were what Jason Todd and Uncle Ben and even Jason Todd's back at this point so I mean, Jason Todd's like, been back for 16 years at this point so that's nothing like, new we're like yeah uh, Uncle Ben's the only one that stays dead maybe they'll bring <laughs> Alfred back as like a serial killer oh my god they do a thing where they break the world again and they, they bring him back and he punches yes, the hole Superman and... Prime punches reality again and Alfred he's back. back He's back, isn't he? He's back in continuity. Superboy Prime is back. Oh, yeah, yeah. They brought him back <laughs> so, with Death Metal. Yeah. So he's somewhere. Yeah, so who knows what's going to happen with that. He should show up in Crime Syndicate. That would be good. God, the DC Universe is so convoluted. It's unbelievable. And it just gets more convoluted every time they try to do a reboot to make it Maybe less Maybe they convoluted. should reboot it again. No! <laughs> Infinite <laughs> crisis on all of the forever <laughs> final Earths. <laughs> yeah. Conver- Convergence 2.0. Take four. Oh. <laughs> Slow. Oh, man. Convergence is the worst crisis. We, we, we enjoy comic books uh, uh, on this comic book centric podcast. But I love comic books and comic book related. But I'll, yeah. I'll be honest, I'm so far at the loop of main continuity, I just prefer reading stuff that's kind of solo series or individual books that come out now. Yeah, but let are. me tell you about Robin 1. Yeah. So Robin's had a, Damien has had a fallout with Bruce. He's kind of off doing his own thing. He has a new costume. It is fully black and red. I think it looks all right. Um, he is, we start off with him kicking King Snake's ass in a cage fight which is fun. King Snake, for those who don't know, is the father of Bane, which makes no sense because Bane looks middle-aged and King Snake also looks middle-aged, but comic books, whatever. Whoops, King Snake's ass gets an invitation to the Tournament of Lazarus, I think it's called, and he reads a little manga in his spare time, which I thought was kind of a funny a funny nod that Damien's a weeb. <laughs> Look, he's it's, got a bow staff, hasn't he? Is, he is that, he's got <laughs> a samurai sword, man. He was raised by the League of Assassins. It fits perfectly. Of course, he'd be into anime. Um, I bet Damien's way into Dragon Ball Z, and but also oh Sailor God. Moon for his sensitive side. Yeah. Um, he hops on a boat, which is the Enter the Dragon part of this whole thing. Yeah. He gets to an island. Uh, he meets the kind of person running the tournament we get a look at some of the other competitors including a conspicuously deadpool looking uh character and not deathstroke looking no this they look more like deadpool than deathstroke does and damien's comment is nice copyright infringement which gave me a legitimate laugh (laughs) um i think in universe he's referencing that the guy looks like slade but Mm. I took it to be a a Deadpool. It's a nice Uh, meta commentary as well. Yes, exactly. And uh, Damien is the, being the hothead he is, is the first one to step up uh, to fight. And a new character named Flatline, uh, a a younger girl, seems to be about his age. Damien, we learn, is about 14 at this time. So he's, he's aged a little bit. I think he was nine or 10 when Grant Morrison introduced him. Uh, she steps up to challenge him, and I'm not going to spoil how that fight goes because, boy, does that issue have an ending to it. I'm looking forward to issue two. I'm interested. Josh Williamson um, writes a really good Damien. Like, he's likable but still kind of a dick, which is a hard balance to strike. Mm-hmm. And the art's also really good. Um, the art, a lot of good angles, great coloring. Um it, it almost reminds me of some of the 
like a more modern kind of Dark Knight Returns type of art. Um, but, but a little bit different. But yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to the rest of that. And then the other thing I read this week that I wasn't going to read at first, but I just I got too curious is Miles Morales Spider-Man number 25. Now, I haven't been reading Miles Morales at all. I the last time I read it was at the start of when they rebooted it all because I have some of the I have some comics lying around that will be from that. But I I, um, yeah, yeah. So after when they incorporated them into the main uh, the main uh, Marvel universe. Right, right, right. Um, and brought back his mom and all that stuff and yeah. brought back his uncle and stuff and, and kept those characters alive. Um, and I, I remember that was a it was a great series. I think I read maybe the... God, it must have been the first maybe 20 or so issues, something like that. Um, but what you have written here really worries me. So... I can see it in order. Right, and so I, I haven't really read Miles Morales since he was in the Ultimate Universe, save for... I read Spider-Man 2 because I, I needed to know... Yeah, who 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 Miles Morales was. Yeah, yeah I didn't Yeah. Um but then they said Miles Morales is getting his own clone saga and I went Oh no. <laughs> so f- for those out there who don't know what clone saga is oh, um Marvel need another clone saga, yeah. West and DC need another reboot. So put it yeah, that way. <laughs> yeah, it's it's basically one of those things that it, it pops up every maybe ten or so years in Spider-Man continuity. Um, um, most well, most famously in the nineties. Yeah, but sure, actually, yeah, but also recently there was yeah, well, you've done it again recently. You've yeah. done it again recently, and that's when you yes. got the. By the way, the phenomenal. I think it was. I can't remember when this was, but it's the Ben Riley Spider-Man book that came yeah. out where he was in Las Vegas. Um, yes. only lasted 20, 20 or so issues. Um, that was phenomenal. I really, really enjoyed that. It was like it happened after all the stuff that happened in uh, the MC, uh, the. I mean, there's all stuff with Doctor Strange and the Hell came up, and Johnny Blaze was the king of Hell. It, you know, that point in Marvel continuity where everything was a little bit out of whack because they were trying to try some new stuff that didn't really work out properly, but some of it did. It um, was all new and all different, but I don't think it was the yeah. actual all new, all different. All different. Yeah. But um, yeah, that's the last time I remember the clone saga being about because it turned out that Ben Riley was alive this whole time and yeah, so we've got and stuff. Yeah. We've got basically the original clone saga saga in the seventies where yeah. the clone was first introduced with the jackal, but I think that was actually just an issue or a couple of issues. Yeah, and Peter throws him in a smokestack. Yes, and, so. and yeah. uh, we've got in the nineties. That's when the clone saga epic that most people know, which was a long drawn out story about spider-man having ben riley as a clone and oh no ben riley's yes uh ben riley's the real peter parker wait no he's not it's a switcheroo it's all been a ruse ah norman osborne's behind it all because of course he is yeah um the biggest thing to come out of the original clone saga or the 90s clone saga was a the introduction of ben riley b the resurrection of norman osborne those are kind of the two big things then Brian Michael Bendis in the mid 2000s was writing Ultimate Spider-Man, which great series. And I think he did the best clone saga. He was like, yeah, there we go. He was like, guys, what if I do a clone saga? And actually, um, the Miles Morales clone saga that we're getting into now reminds me the most in this initial issue of the Bendis clone saga. And I'll tell you why. Um, and then we've got the clone conspiracy, which is what Massimo mentioned with the, again, yep. resurrection of Ben Riley, but now he's an asshole. And, and they actually resurrect Uncle Ben in that one as well. The weird, yeah. Yes. For a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we had a lesser known clone saga that was released recently that is the real clone saga. I only know of this because Comic Pop's Back Issues series covered it. They love the Clone Saga. Oh, boy. Um, (laughs) They don't love the Clone Saga. And all that is is literally some of the writers from the original 90s Clone Saga went back and did a truncated version that's like, well, this is how we'd have written it if we didn't have editorial interference. And it's just like six issues, and it's more or less the same story with a couple of small changes. I haven't read it. I've just heard it summarized. It doesn't sound like it's worth reading. And then now... Of course, the newest Spider-Man, Miles Morales, is getting his own clone saga. They we're doing so well, Marvel. They we're doing so well. So the issue, um, there's not really that much to it yet. Basically, a Miles Morales Spider-Man lookalike is causing trouble, terrorizing people, maybe does a couple of murders. 
Peter Parker runs across Miles, who is investigating, thinks he is the imposter. They do a little fighty fight. And then Miles is like, no, it's me, man. And Peter's like, oh, it's you. And then they team up. And then they chase the imposter across the New York skyline. And then they subdue. Well, they don't subdue, but they they uh, they find him and they face off with him. And it turns out he's got like weird symbiote morphing powers. He can like make his arm all bulky and he's all drippy and weird. Like he's made of mud. <laughs> Great um, start. Yeah. So they fight him. They subdue him. They web him up. And then a second clone shows up. And this one just looks like Miles Morales, but he carries like weird big red blades. I don't know. We don't know okay. anything about him yet. Um, he introduces himself as Salim or Miles Backwards. If you didn't catch Oh my God. It. And then there's also a third clone that pops up uh, right next to them. Who's like a weird arachnid skinny six arm man spider clone. So the reason this reminds me of the Bendis clone saga is Bendis's clone saga had like three or four different Peter clones involved and they were all kind of warped versions of him, mm -hmm. um, which that's what this reminds me of is they're all, they're not like, you know, Ben Riley where he's a perfect clone of Peter or oh, even um, Kane where Kane, he just yeah. has a weird messed up face. They're like these weird mutated clones that remind me a lot of that concept. So, I mean, I guess I'm going to read issue 26 when it comes out. Cause I kind of have to know where this goes. Yeah. It's too late now. <laughs> I'm part of this. Ran too deep. Yeah. All right. They want to shoot. I I have to know you guys. I need to know. This is how comic books work. I don't. I don't want to know. And then I read the first issue, and I'm like, yeah. "Damn it, you got me, son of yeah. a bitch." I mean, to be fair, the last yeah, the last Spider related thing that helped me get back into Spider Man was all the Spider Verse stuff. Mm, yes. Um, and I'd rather them just do more of that, to be honest, than keep going at Clone Saga for the eighth time i mean spider verse could be the new clone saga every five years they do a uh, spider verse yeah. and everyone's like we get it there's a lot of spider-mans yeah. Spider people like that so that's why i read this week um massimo what you've been she been reading i see a couple things here yeah so um basically over the past uh week or so i've been i've been prepping for an interview that's coming up that'll be out after after this podcast, I'll be out something next week or the week after uh, for uh, for uh, a Glasgow based or well, kind of uh, Scotland based uh, comic uh, writer called Fraser Campbell um, and his uh, new Kickstarter series that is basically collecting all of the previous Kickstarters he's done into one volume called Alex Automatic, uh, and it's basically like think of like your classic kind of GI Joe kind of nineteen seventies kind of spy stuff except that it's a guy having constant psychotic breaks due to brainwashing from a Ooh. massive evil like a government agency or kind of like spy organization. And it's kind of like the, the, the story is, is good, but also kind of confusing. Um, I don't want to spoil it because I think we might talk it later on about non superhero comic adaptations, but yes, um, it is one of those things. It's, it's a great independent book um and it really does it definitely subverts the tropes of what you're used to like not like it, there's lots of characters that appear maybe in the first issue or so and then they don't appear elsewhere because stuff happens to them and uh, the, and is that stuff death yes that stuff is death the stuff um, is death, death. <gasps> um but those like the story is told in such a way that it's so fractured that it's definitely follow like you'd follow it and it's great, but it's also in the way that it confuses you that you want to read more, like in the good way, not like oh this is a confusing piece of like mess that I can't read. This is no, like it's something like compelling. That, yeah, like oh my god, like I get what's like, happening here, but there's so much more to the story. Like a good thriller. Um, yeah, it's like yeah, it definitely is based kind of more caught, like towards thriller and kind of even in some way kind of like psychological kind of yeah, Michael Jackson over here. Um, we can the psychological kind of uh situations of like not even horror but kind of like the the emotion and trauma that you can go through by being a spy if that makes sense i'll tell you um, what i like my heroes psychologically damaged uh, we, we all love a psychological one's off. Yeah. yeah exactly They're the most relatable exactly uh but that's that's been great um i've also uh bethany may have mentioned last week we've been watching through all of the mcu in timely order and yes. 
in universe we, chronology. In, yep, in universe chronology. So we're at Iron Man at the moment, excluding obviously Hulk, but like that's, you know, we don't talk about that film uh, with Edward Norton. Uh, See, I, I, when I listened to last week's podcast, I was like, I can't believe they're not watching Incredible Hulk. Like, I don't yeah. think it's a great film, but it's General it's just, Ross and Tony Stark's on it. And I don't know, man. Like, I've seen it. I seen it a lot when I was younger, but I might give it another watch back at some point. I don't know. I just I feel like for me personally, like it doesn't. I I, I remember when Mark Ruffalo was announced for Avengers. I was really quite against it. I was yeah, like, cause... no, Bruce Banner should be a thin, nerdy guy that turns out in this big beast. He shouldn't be a kind of buff jock. Like that's kind of what I see Mark Ruffalo as before yeah. Avengers, and then he totally changed yeah, my mind. Totally, it was brilliant. Totally so. But yeah, yeah, no. Um, but on was it? It's the uh, 13th anniversary today of Iron Man, I believe. Um, 13th anniversary of it coming out. Uh, we watched that, and it's a film that still holds up and yeah. is great. And I have only, I only a few criticisms is that we should have got Obadiah Stane for longer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the yep. way he chews the scenery, but in a way that isn't like overly like 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 ham fisted. But like, just like he's such a perfect villain, and would have been the perfect antagonist to, I like Tony Stark or any other kind of future hero that would take up that mantle. Because as we know, Marvel deep. had not yet figured out that you don't necessarily need to kill yeah. the villain at the end of the movie. But that's what I was going to say. Like, you can say you can kind of forgive them for Obadiah Stane because yeah. at that stage they really didn't know how this was going to go. They didn't know that's that true. it was going to be yeah. a huge success. But by the time we get to like Ultron and they kill him yeah. in one film, it's like really <laughs> that's ultron, when it starts they should have known better at that point yeah ultron though i mean just by nature of what he is they could bring ultron back oh yeah 100%. yeah okay but that was a bad example My, but you know what i'm saying like other you, villains have been killed off yeah, yeah like ulysses yeah. ulysses s claw i feel like is the main one for was me wasted like, yeah he was, was he was totally massive. wasted agreed yeah um but like yeah no a red sky. I mean, yeah, one of those things he well, got blasted off at the space. Well, and he kind of, kind of yeah, yeah. yeah we, he's he's it, pay, it, still it paid off, and it paid off in the long run. I guess you know, kind of safe. It was a good safe. Yeah, yeah it was. It's it, it's like a fumble, you know, the end zone. Like, ah, like, they managed to get that. You don't get to make American football references. <laughs> get out of here! You don't see me talking about your footy. I don't know shit about soccer. Yeah, I, I call I it stay, soccer. Get, Come at me. I, I gotta stay in my name. Um, but no, um, Iron Man still holds up. Uh, phenomenal, uh, a great uh, paper pots by Gwyneth Paltrow, in my opinion. A uh, great uh, portrayal of her um, before she kind of stopped caring about those films. Yeah, um, shame, awesome. shame, shame, shame that she's nuts. And, <laughs> and crazy. yeah, and me and Bethany said this is that if you watch Iron Man and you Terrence Howard is the worst part of that film. I know Marvel fact, and he got paid the most. Well, yeah, he it was he was so wooden. So unbelievably wooden that film is Rhodes. Yeah. Thank um. See God. if you could do. Was yeah. By Don, with Don, Don Cheadle. Cheadle. Like, see love, if you were. Yeah. I love that first scene in Iron Man 2 when Don Cheadle walks out of the room and goes, "This is what's happening. I'm here. This yeah. is that." And it's yeah. it's like clearly breaking it's, the third wall, and you're like, yeah. "Okay." Like it's such a it's such a like Don Cheadle's such a more endearing version of the character. Like they're like when like he finds Tony in the desert, mm-hmm. almost no reaction whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Like the lines are yeah. said with such flatness. Like he he's, he's really phoning it in. He doesn't it's, sound like he's Tony Stark's friend. Stark's friend. Uh-huh. Yeah, he sounds like he's his babysitter. Um, it's funny in hindsight as well. He kind of is. The yeah. scene where he's like, next time, baby. <laughs> like, next time. Mate. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You're yeah. wrong. Um, but yeah, there's, there's so many good parts of that film. Like, obviously, Tony Stark has a heart. That bit's phenomenal where the dummy yeah. comes in, save today, replaces the heart. Um, how'd, you th- how'd you fix the freezing problem is, fuck, is great. Um... The ending, you, the ending, yeah, it's phenomenal. I am the Iron Man. Surprise! You, you didn't. Yeah. They spent so long in the comics having Tony Stark be like, be, Iron, Iron Man's, Man's bodyguard. my bodyguard. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was such a good way to establish that in the MCU, secret identities aren't going to be a thing. Like for well, that point yeah. on, it was like okay, for most okay. people, Spider Man. Well, yeah. Oh. Oh, well, apart yeah. from now, because he's now everyone knows who he is. Because <laughs> the end of, uh... I mean, for the rest of Avengers and stuff, yeah. Like, yeah. I, um, I think Doctor Strange is going to have to say something. He's going to have something yeah, to say about that. There's some wobbly, wobbly, no more day, one more day, whatever it is, magic kind mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. stuff. Um, but no, I, personally, great film. Um, for me personally, I I have a lot of love for that film. Um, it sequels not so much, which I'm going to be getting to because they're next up. 
Um, yeah, Iron Man 2 should be directly next on your dock. It is. Um, and the less we say about that, the better. Apart from Justin Hammer. Um, Sam Iron Man 2 Hammer. has its moments. Yeah, cool, brief, cool brief kiss to it as well. Yeah, yeah. that's probably the yeah. best thing. The action figure. Probably mentioned this. Um, I yeah, want no, my I, bird. Uh, my bird. This is not I my bird. My bird. This it's the bird. bird. It's the bird. You just got it's a bird. Uh, Mickey Rourke doing a terrible Russian accent. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, get anyone else. Um, no, but that is is and obviously first appearance of the Ten Rings. Uh, yes. But are they the real Ten Rings? Do we know? Um, I, I th- the the Ten Rings in Iron Man one that kidnaps Tony Stark. Yes, I believe is is it at yeah. least an offshoot of the real Ten Rings organization. It's an Iron Man yeah. three that we get the fake. Yeah, um, Mandarin. Yeah, yeah, which, yeah, uh, yeah. which I, I wrote in an article about for the website about things you may have missed from the Chan Chi trailer. I'm just going to plug you that sure in. Now. Did yeah, go check things. that out if you haven't read it. Watch read that yeah. Shang Chi trailer. We're getting off topic. Yeah, but uh, sorry. Other than that, that's my uh, for your consideration. It is rewatch Iron Man. It's still good. Yes. What a great, what a miracle of a film. What a miracle of a film. Com- yeah. Almost completely improvised, apparently as well. Thanks, John Favreau. Thank you, John Favreau. Thanks, a, Happy. A, a, a big love to Happy Hogan. Um, big love, all my hearts. Also, I forget Phil Coulson's in that film, and it fills me with joy every time he's on screen. Yes. Um, <laughs> weird when you see the the uh, is it Paramount logo at the start? Yeah, that's yeah. weird. And yeah. hindsight, you're he's like, well, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, strange. Um, yeah. I mean, also, also, just like to touch on that as well. Um, obviously, something that's kind of retconned in is that they make a big thing about she would not have a name. And yeah, yeah, and this film, yeah, yeah, yeah. but but then they kind of record it later on. The lineage we've been known since Shield since the ni- 90s. Like Peggy Carter, yeah, yeah, we've been known Shield for quite a while. That's that's so that's so comic books, though. Yeah, I know, you're I always know. you're gonna get your retcons, you just kind of accept it and go, eh, yeah, they didn't know yet. Again, they didn't know they were gonna go back 20 years and yeah, yeah. Time travel and stuff, yeah. yeah. Um, exactly, but no, um, big, big step up from Captain Marvel. Uh, oh. sorry for all those Captain Marvel fans out there. Um, that's a review for that and say, bye, yep. you're Australia. Yeah. Uh, Dan will make his way through the MCU film because he's, he's <laughs> in his, his, all the MCUs. Um, but no, yeah, that's that's pretty much what we'll be doing this week. Um, yeah, other than that, other major things, yeah. Other than that, uh, Alex Automatic is great. And rewatch Iron Man. Nice. And uh, shout out to, to Bethany, who just had a birthday. Yes. Happy, happy, always... happy belated birthday. That is, that is, I gather, at least partially why she's not on today. Um, <laughs> Dan, lovely Daniel, Daniel Boyd, He's Daniel, here. my boy. The absolute boy that is Daniel. Yes. The absolute unit, the mad lad. You reviewed some stuff. <laughs> I did. Um, I was sent Berserker number two by Ian um, with a message saying Merry Christmas. And I was like, what? And he was like, you don't actually one, do actually two. I'm like, okay. Tell me what fake um, Keanu Reeves is up to. God damn, that was a letdown. Um, oh. Yeah, oh yeah. Um she won, I really enjoyed she won. It was dumb, but it was it was fun. You know, it was like a it was like a Robert Rodriguez just dumb shoot him up, slash him up a sci-fi. Uh issue two takes you back to like ten thousand BC either, and you've got caveman ancestor. Well, no, no, it is him because he has like thousands of year old, years old. So it's Berserker's parents, and yeah, there's some there's some weird stuff that happens hmm. um, with with the the flashback. He's fighting lions and stuff, and I'm reading it going, I didn't come to get a 2000 BC book. I came to get a weird sci-fi <laughs> Keanu Reeves book. Do you know what I mean? And he doesn't even look like Keanu in the book. It, it, the, the way they stage it, it starts with like him with therapist or whatever giving an interview and he's like she's like oh how'd you get your powers and he's like oh my mom get struck by lightning or something when i was pregnant some contrived <laughs> shit like that and uh and i came out and i was immortal and it was piss poor really really bad for those listening i'm making faces i was gonna yeah. say yeah, I'm, I'm doing yeah. the same uh i mean uh, issue three might pick up it might be more like the first issue but issue two was was garbage really that's bad. too bad yeah How about cyberpunk? um what's up with that Cyberpunk, the book, the, yeah. the yeah. comic. <laughs> no, now what's up with the game? We only have well, so much well, time. Well, we know, we all know. <laughs> I am, I am um, almost finished the game. I've got the last mission sitting there, so I'm doing side missions now, and then I'm going to do the final mission. And then I think the is it the tenth of next month is the six month anniversary. So I actually plan on having a review up around that time. 
Uh, uh, I'll read it because there's no way I'm going to own anything that will play that game to a reasonable standard. I, I will own that game when they re-release it back on PlayStation 4. Uh, <laughs> Good luck. Um, so, the the com- see that, that issue, right? That comic, um, the Cyberpunk issue, it is a weird one because it's well written in the sense that it captures the essence of the game. Dialogue is feels like it you know is lifted from the game the characters right. feel it they're lifted from the game but the problem is the dialogue in the game is utter garbage <laughs> do you know what i mean it's so it's so cheesy edgy 15 year old patter that it's like yes you've you've captured it well so well done but jesus it's really hard to read like, so do you think like, this perfectly encapsulates the tone the problem is the tone is not good right exactly they need to lean into that maybe if they have, if they do more issues of that, do you need to lean I mean, into the cheesiness of it and kind of maybe, really maybe I'm up. like maybe I'm like not a good person to ask because I don't enjoy the dialogue in the game. But if you do enjoy that kind of cheesy almost like cheesy bad eighties film dialogue, yeah. then the book might be for you. Like in that sense, if it's more of the same. If you like the game, you'll probably like the book. That sounds um, like I might dig it. I don't like the story and the dialogue in the game. Um so I don't didn't really like the book, but the art's good. The art's really good, um, and there's a few characters introduced that aren't in the game that um, that actually are fairly interesting, and I, I kind of want to see where they go. Um, but yeah, it's it's a it was a weird one to review because I'm like, this is well done, but I don't like it. Do you know what I mean? It was a strange yeah. one to kind of write about. It's, it's like the uh, I don't know, greater than the sum of its parts sort of thing. Uh, clearly, not as good as some of its parts. Yeah, I was going to say. I think I mentioned in the review. This creative team is clearly very talented. The art's beautiful. Mm. The coloring is good. The lettering is good. Everything. The creative team are great, but you it's just like it's just not a good subject matter for me. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, are you going to pick up number two when it comes out? Uh yeah. I kind of want to see where it goes. There's a certain character. Um, I think it's the main character's mother or grandmother. Um, she's actually very interesting. At first, I was like, "Why am I seeing this old woman in a diner?" And then when you see more of her, because it just cuts to her kind of randomly. And then when you see more of her, I'm like, "Oh no, this is this could be interesting." Her character. So okay. Yeah. Well, I'll be interested to know if it uh, picks up at number two. Yeah. Uh, lastly, on your list here is Michael B. Jordan's new banger, "Without Remorse," a Tom Clancy film on uh, Amazon Prime. I actually, I've been meaning to watch that because I like Michael B. Jordan as an actor. That's actually the only reason I've never been particularly interested in anything Tom Clancy related, except for maybe like the early Rainbow Six games and Splinter Cell. Jack Ryan's good. The main reason that I checked it out actually was it was written by Taylor Sheridan, who, (laughs) if you don't know, wrote Sicario and they wrote and directed Wind River. (laughs) Okay. So, good resume. And that show Yellowstone, he does that as well. So, talented writer um he didn't direct this one but he wrote it so i'm like ah it's worth a, worth a go and again i like michael b jordan mm-hmm. and yeah i like tom clancy um so i'm like yeah i'll check it out and the first half was okay and by the end i totally lost interest oh, um, full disclosure i was quite drunk when i was watching it and i'm sitting going like that right this is like going to be a john wick punisher because i knew the basic plot is family die and he goes after right. the people that did it right so i'm like right okay that's what i was expecting and he feels um, no remorse about the matter is what i'm right like, yeah right so i'm watching it and i'm going right okay i've seen all this before like oh his family get killed oh he's dead sad like you've seen it all right <laughs> if you've yeah. seen john wick or punisher or whatever you, you... so we go through all that and then they start kind of making it kind of conspiracy based like there's more going on behind the scenes and I'm like, I don't mind conspiracy stuff in a film like this. They can kind of work that in. And then that kind of becomes the whole film. is all about this conspiracy he's uncovering. And it's more of that than it is like, let's go and get revenge and shoot everybody like John Wick. And that's what I thought I was getting. So when it went more like conspiracy heavy and, oh, this person's like to this person. And, oh, we need to go speak to this person. There's more dialogue scenes. I'm like, why is he not John Wick in MD yet? Why There's is there no headshots happening? <laughs> kind of a tonal shift you didn't expect it. Sounds yeah, like. I just... I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's my fault. For do you like, think that's intentional? Maybe that they they advertised it as one thing because they capitalize on kind of John Wick, kind of. Are you saying they're trying like to subvert audience expectations? There's a conspiracy. Other, if otherwise, to... no one does movie market and clickbait. Exactly. The um, Johnston effect. It's a conspiracy. Um, so yeah, the uh, there's one good scene. He's in a prison and yeah. he like floods the sink and he wraps his shirt around his hand and all these guards come out the room and he. He absolutely knocks the shit out of all of them. And that's a cool scene. So um, he does a and, 
the choreography is good. The choreography is quite the raid John Wick that did quick, you know, knives and like all that stuff's good when it happens, but it's so like sparingly used. I thought that was going to be the whole second half of the film, and by the end, I was I was checking my phone. I was like, oh, how long's left? Like, yeah, it just it was fine. I'll probably still give it a watch just to. Maybe you feel different because by the same. end, I was really quite drunk, but I, I, um, I wasn't great. I know some people were talking about this could lead into a Rainbow Six uh, adaption. Um, Rainbow has mentioned on it. Yeah, so as part of the conspiracy scene when they're going through like the boardrooms and stuff, Rainbow is is it an Amazon Amazon exclusive? uh, Yeah, it's Amazon. It's on Amazon Prime. Yeah. Okay, so most likely it will probably get enough streams to gather enough thing that you never know there might be a Rainbow because like uh, Jack Ryan, some of the best spy television I've seen in a while. I mean, Um, I watched it. It's great. I really, really enjoyed the first first season. Great. The second season's good, but not as not as good. Okay, that is prime territory <laughs> uh prime territory for amazon to have their own cinematic universe just the the tom clancy burst let's get yeah a, yeah let's get let's I get mean, rainbow six going let's get a splinter cell movie yeah oh man well, there, was, there was supposed to be a splinter cell movie a few years ago with tom hardy i heard yeah well yeah. let's do it let's i am actually yeah. i'm far i think splinter cell is more ready to be made into a movie because it has an actual Real story behind it than any other Tom Clant. Let's get a Hawks movie. Yeah. Let's oh my God. God. It'll, be like, it'll be like the crappiest, like uh, Tom, Tom Clancy's end game. Yeah. You have uh, like, yeah. on the headset and stuff. And yeah. <laughs> well, here's the thing I was going to say is that like that kind of whole thing about and obviously not getting too far off topic. The, the interesting thing of like if they were to bring, uh, like, uh, Splinter Cell and stuff like that, and bringing back Sam Fisher into like some sort of form, it would it would probably be everyone's been so hesitant for years to actually do it that I feel like Amazon is the only one because Ubisoft have been like humming and hawing at it like they brought him back in smaller roles but I refused to make a full game for him yeah, so to bring him back in maybe that cinematic form through some weird Tom Clancy cinematic universe could spark some fired yeah, up yeah. the arse of uh, Ubisoft and we could end up with I the only, my two predictions for the last three like, years has had that one up <laughs> Ubisoft video game movies are yeah, mm, not bad. a great track record. Yep. Yeah, I'm still mad about Prince of Persia. I, I fell asleep watching Assassin's Creed on the plane. Yeah, I played and fell asleep. What if we made a Prince of Persia movie? And hear me out. We had <laughs> Donnie Darko, <laughs> the Jake whitest man in the play the Prince of Persia, the white guy. What and... a waste of Jake Gyllenhaal as well. What a great actor. <laughs> what I an mean, absolute mess. Yeah. You know what he would have been perfect for. Film adaption of the 2008 Prince of Persia reboot. Yeah. Do you want me to Troy he Baker? That, yeah, he or uh, Troy Baker or Nolan North or whoever, one of those guys. Nolan North, my bad. Uh, Nolan North. Yeah, he yeah. would have fit that character perfectly. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, I can't go into Prince. That movie's. I have so many. Sands of Time is one of my favorite video games of all time, top three. So that movie. Hmm. Yep. Yeah, I'm making fists. <laughs> fists. That's bad. Um, yeah. Boy, we really need to get on to news because we're already at almost 50 minutes here. <laughs> this is going to be a long one, guys. And you know what? There's so far nothing I feel like editing out. So I mean, Elf was yeah. kind of relevant in some capacity, right? We're, we're yeah, good. You know, I feel like we have a good thing going here. Well, so news. Well, well, see, he's not supervising. He's to be doing his comic mark today. <laughs> Oh yeah, so he's not yelling at us every couple when, of seconds of how when long the cat's gonna... away, the mice come out to play. This is what <laughs> happened just... when you and Alan ran the show by yourselves, and yeah. I wasn't yeah. there. And now yeah. I'm the I'm contributing to the madness. <laughs> um, <clears throat> first and foremost, except not really foremost, Sin City is getting a 30th anniversary edition. Not a lot to say about this. Um, there's some pictures of it. It looks like really good packaging. Uh, the release is coming as a celebration uh, for the milestone anniversary. It's got a new wraparound cover art and pinup gallery from Joyce Chin, Amanda Connor, Klaus Jansen, longtime Frank Miller um, collaborator. Collaborator. Yes. That's the word I was looking for. Thank you. Paul Pope, Philip Tan, and Gerardo Zafino. Lots of great artists uh, will be featured in the soft cover editions. Sin City, I really liked the movie. Um, the comic is kind of hit. Or miss it's definitely one of the more stylistic pieces of frank miller's library and it's just before he kind of went totally off the deep end so i probably won't pick this up but if you're a fan yeah. or a frank miller enthusiast maybe this is for you 
I, I'll be honest, I've never actually read or seen uh, Sin City before. Oh, you um, should. You definitely if you've, should. If you've seen the movie, you've read Sin City. Okay. Yeah, as as like a, a shot by shot storyboard, they used the comic as a storyboard for the film. Yeah, but um, the second film's not good. But the I did not watch that one. but the book, um, I've got the compendium, the big damn Sin City, and it's got everything in it. Um, the the artwork and and I don't. I'm I'm actually going to bring up Sin City later in our discussion topic. Um, mm-hmm. so I'll go more into it then. But the the, the artwork in Sin City is the best artwork Frank Miller's ever did, like yeah. by far. I, I, I'm not a big Frank Miller guy, so maybe coming from me that doesn't mean much. But in terms of his artwork, but um, I think Sin City is a gorgeous book. So I see some of the splash pages in that book are stunning, really much striking. Anything Frank Miller draws prior to the turn of the century is really good. Wolverine with um, Chris Claremont, mm. fantastic. Uh, as far as I, I'm I hate the art in Dark Knight Returns. I know that's I love good, the art in Dark Knight Returns. Not a fan um, at all. No comment. I, I love the art in his. Did he do the art in his Daredevil run, or was that no? Uh, that was Mazzucchelli. John Romita. John John Mazzucchelli was born again. John Romita Junior was okay. Mammoth Without oh. Fear. I. You know what? Jr. Jr.'s art in the eighties and nineties to a certain extent was fine. His art nowadays, yeah, 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 yep, 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 yep. yep. Um, Made Fire, which I had never heard of until this week, uh, a browser-based digital. Uh, publishing platform with an app that was created by Ben Wolstenholm, Liam Sharp, and Eugene Walden um, has entered a bankruptcy-like st- uh, situation that will leave the app no longer updated or supported. Uh, the big problem there is that app is the platform that Boom Studios and Archie bases their digital platforms off oh, of. Oh no! So by Boom. virtue of Made Fire going under. Um, the Archie and Boom Studios digital apps are also going to actually by now uh, the they stop being available the first of May. So as of today, if you purchased any comics on those, you cannot access them anymore. Oof. Yeah, yeah. It sucks. Boom would be I, doing great as well. Like they'd be back, doing for, back below for the industry, eh? yeah. Uh yes. So Archie um, announced it was shutting down its app, uh, but it did note that it would set users up with a one month trial of Comicsology Unlimited. Um, they're also offering some free uh, comics to people as kind of a make good. I guess it's the best you can really do. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, far, nothing as far as I know from Boom Studios about how they're going to move Boom have, Boom have been on fire, though, over the past few months. They've producing yeah. like series after series of like great, like amazing books, like just interesting characters. Like one of my favorite yeah. Kinder series from them, Once the Future's been coming out, uh, Proctor Valley Road as well by oh, Matt yeah, Morrison. Oh, yeah, you're real into Proctor Valley Road. Yeah, yeah. And, and the fact that that's like, for Boom. digital service, yeah. I would say in the last like five years, Boom's yeah. or maybe maybe less than five, maybe like the last two years, Boom's yeah. creativity and output has been like on a par with like Image in the nineties. Oh yeah, like or just when Image formed and it was all these like new creative yeah. good stories. That's like Boom. Oh man, it? yeah, yeah. Boom, have, Boom have basically been getting like some top top creators. You know, uh, Grant Morrison. You've got uh, uh, Pat Nadell as well. Mm-hmm. Okay. Pat Nadell. Um, just like just. Like all of these, I can name more if, uh, if I give me a list. Uh, but like, like all of these, like actually great creators, and the fact that obviously because we're still in the middle of a pandemic, because we're going to date this this podcast when we say this. I don't know what um, you're talking about. Yeah, right. Um, stuff just just opening up, and obviously, like it's lucky that it's now that it's happening, and not like last year or like in the middle when everything was closed down, you couldn't get physical copies of anything. Yeah, so but it's still, yeah, want to ask? Yeah. Would you then say that Boom Studios is exploding in quality? <laughs> yeah, but but now after now it, this, now situation, it's exploding in a bad way. Yeah. Yeah. Now after this situation, they're gonna hopefully they don't go kaboom. We're done here. Boo. Yeah. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> well, thanks for listening to this. Come back next week to talk about comic books. No, but um, that's um, it's a real big blow. Yeah. So that's really unfortunate. And Archie, I'm sure. I mean, obviously, you can get their stuff on Comicsology. You you get pretty much everything on Comicsology. Do you know if you can? I don't know if you can get Boom Studio stuff on. I, that, think, I think you can, but it's it's a monopolization in the market that really is, yeah. you yep. know, not great. Um, which um, especially I mean, with all Marvel stuff that and DC have their own thing going on. They've got um, DC Universe Infinite, Marvel Unlimited. God, we can. Well, that's not some of that stuff isn't available over here in the UK. 
oh, yeah. um, in Europe. So like we still have to rely on out maybe outsource publishers. Um, Get and you all a this- VPN, homie. Yeah, right. We'd and be a sponsor. North VPN be a or something like that. You want to sponsor us? We'll talk about you. We'll tell you about you. Soft shot, I, please. I uh, use <laughs> Express VPN. They're pretty good. Yeah, but it, it's a weird one, and and I definitely think it definitely is as you have in the notes here the situation highlights the the problems we just have with the idea of purchasing yeah. digital content um and, and it's a massive blow because you put all your money into this and now you can't you, you well hopefully you just can get access to it but you what? you know for the moment i mean look at um look at what happened last month when sony announced they were gonna shut down the ps3 and ps vita stores um they ended up walking it back because it was such an unpopular yeah. decision but yeah We've got things like that. We've got uh, the shutdown of the original Xbox 360, Xbox Live. And I hate to yeah. tell y'all, but someday Steam is going to die. Yeah, It might not be in our lifetime, but it's, it'll happen. It's, no, but it is a problem. Like Things going forward digitally and like, digital licensing and stuff like that, um, it is a problem for like legacy because mm-hmm. there's now... It's happening in gaming and now it's happening in comics as well. I mean, Preservation comics, is a real problem. You're, you're, still, was, you're going to have like your mom and pop... Yeah. like you know stone brick comic stores but mm-hmm. for the most part i mean a lot of people are digital only now because it's less space and all the rest yeah. of it um but yeah i mean with, with the gaming industry there's like there's certain games that came out like 10 plus years ago that you just can't play anymore just i can't remember the last accessible. time i purchased a physical copy of a game um i do i i still i still try and i'm about half and half yeah i'm half and half but um it was... as a problem yeah yeah it seems so pointless to me when it's you're just installing the disc so you can or you're just buying the disco, you can install it to the hard drive on your console and then download a patch that's as big as the install in the first place. Yep. And at that point, I'm like, I may as well just purchase it digitally. It's going to save me time. It's it's a matter of convenience. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I've sought a lot, like, book-wise. Not really comic books. Comic books, I still kind of prefer having physical, digi- uh, physical uh, format. But, like, normal books, a lot easier to, instead of having, yeah. like, thick 500-page novels or whatever Kindle, it is, homie. have them. Yeah um yeah no i'll still buy, i still buy physical comic books part of that's because i like having even if it's something i've already read digitally i like having the physical thing yeah um maybe more so than books because it, it is a physical it's the art you know you really get yeah um obviously with digital you can like zoom in on the art but there's something about having it in your hand it's, it's a vessel yeah. feeling yeah yes and then also i like to support you know local business local, local yeah. comic shops so well i that. think i think as well and, and this is a, a thing that is is, is is as present as the idea of like having digital streaming mm-hmm. um and and the big issue with that being that some stuff just isn't available on streaming yeah um i mean bethany had this problem because she really likes the tv show grim mm. um but the issue with that in the uk is that keeps bouncing around rights holders so we were shopping the day and we saw it was on blu-ray and it was like three quid it was like 10 quid for the first three seasons or whatever on blu-ray mm-hmm. and we bought that and and I think just the, the the fact that like people who advocate digital only libraries are in such a thing where like there's going to be so many things that slip through the cracks that are classic beloved films. Yeah. Well, m- what what I've found, um, see, I think film is slightly different because I was actually reading an article about this, and it wasn't like advocating for piracy because obviously it hurts the industry, right? But streaming piracy is a big kind of problem for the entertainment industry just now. But see, long term, as as Ian's saying, right, things like Steam, Netflix. Amazon Prime, they're going to disappear one day, they're going to change one day. Things like Without Remorse, that doesn't probably doesn't even have a physical release. Yeah. The only way to watch that in 50 years' time is going to be on an illegal streaming site. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So for purposes like that, maybe piracy is a good thing. It might preserve some of these things that you can't get anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas, obviously, things like games and comics, although there is you know places you can illegally download that stuff, it's not as, as pertinent as, as movie streaming, you know, as, yeah. as um, live streaming. Well, that's where you end up with the legal gray area of things like emulation and, and yeah, you know, yeah, it's a whole, yeah, it's a whole mess. So, I mean, hopefully, um, going get, getting back to the the core topic here. Hopefully, you know, Boom has a good place to put their stuff. Obviously, I'm sure Archie is going to continue unhindered. I just kind of feel bad for the people that may have lost whole yeah. libraries of, of comics. With I, um, Alan might be affected by that, by the way. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know how many. I know he. I think he was reading through some stuff, but he has a lot of stuff that's digital as well as physical. So, yeah. Um, I don't know if he maybe has a lot of stuff going through comicology, but I remember him mentioning he has. I think he has some boom stuff. Yeah. No, we'll have to. We'll have to ask just to get a man on the street opinion. Um, yeah. 
A little bit cooler news, a little less of a downer. We've got a couple of Marvel costume leaks this week. Uh, the first one is Hawkeye. Yep. In his Disney Plus show is getting a comics accurate costume. There were some shots of Jeremy Renner on set that came out and he's basically wearing an adaption of the Matt Fraction Hawkeye suit with the purple V on the chest. Uh, the biggest difference is this one has sleeves. Some people theorize it's so they don't have to cover up Jeremy Renner's tattoos. Just saves a little money. Um, I think it looks pretty sweet. Yeah, it's, it's my favorite Hawkeye suit from the comics, so I'm I'm all for it. It looks a hell of a lot better than the tunic thing he was wearing in, what was that, Age of Ultron? Yeah. yeah it's kind it of, I think that was supposed to be kind of an adaption of his ultimate Hawkeye suit. Hmm. I mean, all I'm seeing online is the people the, the people making fun of Hawkeye for having no sleeves throughout all of the films and being like, Tony Stark develops an iron, like an iron spider suit for Spider-Man and hands human being, but Hawkeye still runs around jumping through windows with, with no sleeves on. <laughs> well, he, he's just trying to save time. I mean, you could be like Bucky who wears things with sleeves but really seems to have a just problem rip. with sleeves. <laughs> yeah. I th- honestly, my favorite line in Falcon and Winter Soldier is when uh, when Sam's uh, military uh, connection there is like, oh, you got your sleeve back. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. okay. We're just going meta. Um, so that, that looks really cool. Uh, Marvel Phase 4 seems to be going real hard into the comic accurate costumes. We got Captain America Sam Wilson. We got Scarlet Witch wearing her stuff. We got Hawkeye in a comic accurate costume and second leak this week is some set photos of Miss Marvel uh, in in her costume for her upcoming Disney Plus show. Also, astonishingly comic accurate. Did you guys see what that looked like? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, man. It looks, okay. it looks, yeah. it looks I, right off the page. I was yeah. going to say it does look right off the page, but I think I think one of the big things that like it's and I think Kamala Khan and the comics, a great thing about her is that it's it's one of these things, it's not a sexualized version of a yes. young female superhero. And oh. I feel like we've been waiting for that. Or, you know, I think a lot of girls around the world and, and, and young women and people who want to feel represented, mm-hmm. uh, you know, people who, you know, like they don't fit. Like the, like the issue with comic books is that if you look at people like, say, Marvel Girl or kind of Black Widow or like whatever, you look at their comic accurate suits, it's very heavily sexualized. And I yeah. feel like Marvel did a great job where they are actually doing the right thing and considering this is how this character looks like and we're not going to make any changes because it's such a key part of the character of this costume. Yeah. yeah. Well, they, they did really well with Scarlet Witch because the reason yeah. uh, she didn't have a comic accurate costume in the beginning is because they looked at how she was designed in the comics and Elizabeth Olsen was like, I'm not wearing that. Um, of course, they did have one nod with the Halloween costume to her actually wearing an extremely comic accurate a version of the costume in the show, but I, I think their final design that is kind of an evolution of her whole kind of be trench coated look. Yeah. Uh, was, was a really good call. Um, unfortunately, no matter how they change the costumes, uh, dudes in comic books will always yeah. be muscle bound bodybuilders that give me a constant sense of body dysphoria. So there's no getting away from that. Give us, give us a, a dad bod superhero. Like I can't wait for red guardian or whatever it is. David Harbour's. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I'm waiting, yeah. I'm waiting on a man. Wait, wait on that. Like kind of not super bulky dude, like bulky dude, but, but chunky kind of thing. Yes. Also, it's, it's kind of interesting that Scarlet Witch didn't have a comic accurate costume when you consider that Joss Whedon directed the first appearance so far. Yeah. <laughs> Joss Whedon directed the Voltron, that's... Yeah. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> how, how did she get away with that? Uh, um, I think the Marvel uh, Studios higher-ups might have had a bit more say in that. Just, ju- just the Marvel Studios, like Kevin Feige with a fucking spray bottle. No! <laughs> no! 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 <laughs> Firefly oh. was a good show, but you don't get to do this. No, no, again. <laughs> um, um, but no, um, I think even the stuff that's coming at Spider Man, um, there with that kind of like kind of they kept with the, the deck cool looking kind of suit with the um, the kind of the black kind of underwing, kind hey, of blacky blue. And, now's the time, yeah. underarm spider webs. Yeah, I know sex. they kind of had it in uh, uh, Homecoming, far mm. from home. But just go mm-hmm. all the way, just yeah. go all full dick co. Yeah, hundred percent. I feel like I feel like we need a lot about that kind of classic space into comic books because I feel like if we're gonna do it now, why why not do it now? You know, we're established with these characters. We could take risks. 
I think if it's, which I don't think it's really much of an if anymore, but let's, until it's officially confirmed, let's just say if it's true that Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield are showing up in No Way Home, um, I, I think there's definitely a possibility that MCU Spider-Man could take some cues from their costumes and kind of streamline yeah. his suit to look I a think little the, bit more like the classic Spider-Man. And I could be reading this into way too much. I think the renewal of the Marvel properties, you know how like everything's going to Disney Plus? Mm-hmm. Like they do got a deal. I feel like that cements the fact that that they're gonna appear, in my opinion. Oh yeah. Because yeah. I feel like they would they would not be putting the back catalogue on of these films. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Uh, my my opinion. It, it, oh, could, yeah. it, it could be it could be tied around, but I feel like if that doesn't for me that cements it like I am like this film is gonna include at least some nod and some probably not a full like because it, you know, it's reportedly going to be under two hours. This film, like, it's going to be like an hour. I think it's going to be an hour and forty or something like that. I don't know. I don't know how specific, but you know, most most Marvel films tend to be just under two hours. Yeah, yeah. Um, I follow the money. Yeah, but I feel like personally, yeah, I feel like, uh, in terms of of you know going for comic accurate suits, uh, if they want to stream it down and they want to give them give them something that is at least a little bit unique, not something that like you know like. I, like I feel like you you saw it in Far From Home where they were given they gave Spider Man the Night Monkey suit, the kind of the all black suit. The, <laughs> Spider Man Noir, the Spider Man Noir, yeah. Like being able to, and even in the Spider Verse itself, I've uh, been able to branch away from these traditional interpretations interpretations of a character, and people to still know who it is. Yeah. Oh, that is Spider Man, or oh, that is Miss Marvel, or oh, that is Ho- Ho- Hawkeye. You know, regardless yeah. of what the the suit is, and I feel like that's a good thing for the future of of uh, the MCU. Definitely. Uh, speaking of of Marvel. Uh, we've got a couple of other Marvel things this week. Uh, big one, and this we have to really emphasize this. This has not been confirmed yet. However, there are rumblings and rumors that NetherRealm Studios is working on a Marvel fighting game. And that could be a couple of things. That could just be a strict Marvel fighting game. It could just be... You could be Spider Man, you can beat up Iron Man. But what it also could be, based on other properties that NetherRealm has handled, is it could be the oft requested, long fabled Marvel versus DC game, which would be super cool. I would buy that day one. Mm-hmm. Hell yeah. yeah. Especially um, if it's with the Injustice engine. Hell yeah, man. Yeah, man. Mm-hmm. I, I, I love the idea of. Like you know, fighting Spider Man versus Iron Man and things like that, and, and as you said, in that engine with the the transition stages and punching guys through walls, and yeah, it'd be cool. Yeah, especially that. because um, I was not wowed by Marvel versus Capcom Infinite, so I would no. welcome a new fighting game that lets me beat up Marvel characters with other Marvel characters that isn't done by Capcom. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know if it's just me, and I'm not really like a big fighting game guy. But for me, when it comes to fighting games, like Nether Realm, where it's at, they they are like cream of the crop. So yeah, I mean, if you're going to get them to do it, get them to do it. I'm mm-hmm. very bad at Street Fighter and Marvel vs. Capcom and all that. Now, here's the here's the other thing. Possibly okay at Mortal Kombat. <laughs> do you think? Do you think instead of it being just a Marvel DC game, do you think it could be you know how they done DC versus Mortal Kombat? <laughs> Well, Back in the day, um, I, 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 wrote, I wrote the news piece on it, um, and I was going to actually mention that. I was going to mention it could be Marvel could versus Marvel. I did, I did actually mention that, um, that it, it has been speculated, although it's highly unlikely that we could get a merge of Marvel versus DC. Um, you know, you could have your Injustice characters fighting, fighting Spider Man and Iron Man and stuff like that. But I just, yeah. I don't see it from all the deals that Disney have got what with about, Marvel. And, what, and, I mean, about, Warner Brothers games have are behind DC, so obviously they also own the rights to the well, films. Well, that's so that's not that, an issue. But you, you see a bunch of characters, like DC characters, popping up in uh, Mortal Kombat. You know, mm-hmm. you've got Spawn and Joker and, and all these kind of things. So, I mean, if neither of them have the rights to a Marvel game, like, what would stop the two from crossing over in some capacity? I will tell you what. Ooh. People did not like Marvel or uh, uh, MK versus DC. Um, the mm-hmm. fact that it was hampered by the T rating because DC didn't want its characters to be uh, involved in fatalities and things like that. Um, it, it's it's different when you've got a guest character here and there, especially if it's like Joker and Mortal Kombat. It's easier to get away with. Yeah, but I, I would 
I would argue though that they've 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 kind of perfected that happy medium since then because Marvel versus um, sorry uh, DC versus uh, Mortal Kombat was kind of before Injustice, and Injustice is quite brutal and quite you know hard hitting, but it's not decapitations, ripping its spines, you know, eating yeah, people's faces. I mean, yeah. it's, so I, I think they actually have found a balance that it is, it's fatalities and things still feel satisfying. They're not called fatalities, they're called like finishers or whatever in, yeah. in Injustice. But, but um, that fits the tone of the DC universe. I just, I can't see them mm. being, I can't see them being excited to, I mean, let's like Ed Boon and Netherrealm really revel in the cartoon violence and Mortal Kombat. I can't see themselves, uh, I can't see them mm. chompy at the bit to kind of Hamper well, that I mean, in any amount again. I was going to, my argument there was going to be well, they've done it with Superman and he was a good character, but they made him into a bad character. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I will be honestly, if Injustice 3 was straight up universes crossing over Marvel and DC, I would. Well, there's a heavy multiverse implication in the second one, isn't there? A little, yeah, they got into the multiverse stuff in the, in the second one. That was a big, yeah. um, I mean, really. Yeah, yeah. The first one, yeah, technically. The first always, one, that was the conceit. Uh, it, it it reminds me a lot of like Crisis on Two Earths becoming Crisis on Infinite Earths, and yeah. Go go read a review for Injustice Two. I wrote that as well. Oh, uh, that game's good. I like that game. It's I great, didn't, yeah. I didn't see what score you gave it, but I give it a four out of five. Four. I think I think I was the same. No, yeah. um, I think that's just about done with news, right? I think we've covered okay. all the kind of major talking points for this week, or is there anything else? Uh, there's a couple more, there's a couple more that things. I kind of wanted to hint towards. Um, um, on your way in. No, you can go. There were some other game leaks if you want to cover those yeah. real quick, mm-hmm. Daniel. That, that's kind of what I wanted to, I wanted to ah, touch right, on. Okay. Um, there has been more holes in the gaming industry this week than Alicky Boat. Like, honestly, <laughs> it's crazy the amount of leaks that we're getting. Um, there's, we've already spoken about the Nether Realm fighting game, but um, there's three more. One of which is pretty much, I would bet my reputation on it being true. One that could go either way, and one that I'm really unsure about. The one that I'm unsure about is a Spider Man 2 leak um, for Insomniac's sequel to the first Spider Man game. Mm. Um, and it's it's um, it's story leaks, it's plot details. Mm. Um, they suggest that Venom will appear and there will be a symbiote story. I mean, um, I think that's reasonable. That seems like the natural next step. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, though, I would I would line up with the ending of the first game where you see yeah. Harry and the tank at the end, and you seen like a symbiote. But yeah, the yeah. leak says that Harry Osborn won't be Venom in the sequel. Um, we'll instead see Peter Parker as the symbiote host, so he'll get the black suit, um, and then you'll get your own kind of gameplay mechanics with that black suit. I think. Kind of like I think. Web of shadows. No, yeah. what, what's the what's someone called as well? Friend or foe? Uh huh. The other one. Yeah, that was another one. No. Yeah. Um. I. I mean, I'm excited for that game. I really enjoyed. Um. I really enjoyed the first one. I haven't had a chance to play Miles Morales yet because I'm a skint new student. So I haven't had a chance to buy a full full price game. Um but I've only heard good things about that as well. Um but I couldn't really see I I, I feel like the 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 they always hinted at it uh in the first development when people were asking where's the black suit, where's the black suit? Um and they were like, Oh, we have plans for it and stuff like that. So I feel like they definitely they could do a Carnage, maybe Venom situation where Harry Osborne becomes Carnage, similar to Norman Osborn does in the comics, mm-hmm. right? Um, well, the, the, the other the other part of the leak, the part that I think could be very true. Um, well, there, there's there's another part. I read this first. So allegedly, um, Norman Osborn won't appear in the game. We won't be getting Green Goblin, but we will be getting Lizard, uh, Wraith, and several other villains. Um, the part that I think could be very true is that you'll be able to play as both Peter and Miles Morales. Um, oh, yeah. the, the two Spider Men because we've had you know the spin off it would just make sense. Um, yeah, the, absolutely. M- Miles is going to have his own set of side missions, but the game will mostly also be a Peter Parker story. I mean, they um, did it in the first one, didn't they? They, they had you play as Mary Jane. They had yeah. you play as a not well, unpowered Miles. That's yeah. that's my one hope that they get rid of those sections because they <laughs> really slowed that game down. Um, yeah, and then the, apparently when you finish the game, you'll be able to hot swap like GTA Five style between Miles that would and be Peter. Really cool, especially um, given their different power sets. Oh yeah. yeah, with visibility and venom blast and kind of yeah. Yeah, so I think it could be real cool. Something else that's also a nice. Um, I don't know. Again, I don't know if this is true. This leak, but 
it's always a problem in sequels where you, you've maxed out the character in the first game and then you start the second game and you're totally like depowered again. Well, apparently in this, any gadgets and suits that you unlocked in the first game, you can transfer over from an old save file. So you start oh. with all your abilities and your suits and things like that. So that was a nice um, wee inclusion, I thought. That must, that must mean they have better, maybe big plans of as to new abilities and stuff, like entirely new... Yeah, mm. yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe go for an RPG skill tree kind of thing, maybe rather than because obviously they had a skill tree before, but like maybe a proper, like make your own Spider Man kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, if any character aside from like Iron Man is really uh, fitting for kind of a power customization sort of thing, it would be you know Peter Parker with his inventor genius attributes. Um, I, still, I still don't like the new face change though I still prefer old Peter face yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, so the next leak that came out um, this is one that I think could go either way because I've heard it sounds a bit unbelievable but I've heard multiple sources report on it um, and it's there's several apparently several Metal Gear Solid leaks and uh, remakes and active de- development I have heard that Bluepoint are working on a remake of the original game I have heard that the second game is being remade by a different studio um, just loads of different stories on this that I'm like, there's too much here not to there's have. There's got to be sort of... something in that. In yeah. that there's got to be a kernel of truth yeah. in since, that pile of corn. Since uh, I, I wrote that story, and since then, Konami have said that they won't be E3. So but regardless of whether this is a true or not, we're not going to find out in is it June E3. Um, so we'll probably need to wait to a wee bit longer. But, Konami yeah. are super secretive anyway, so like I feel like we wouldn't have found out even if they, they were developing it, even if they were there. Like It would have been just like... See, it's weird, man. They used to be super, like, when they had Kojima, he was, like, their front man. They used to put him oh, out and, oh, yeah. and be like, oh, yeah. That's my five-minute-long trailer. Yeah. None of yeah. this is in the game. And then they had that massive fallout and were like, no, we're just going to do, like, gambling game. Oh, games. poor yeah. Silent Hills, how we hardly knew Which, you. That kind of makes me concerned for any possible MGS remake um, without Kojima at the helm. I, what I wonder, no, I don't know if this is because it was quite a bitter fallout. But I wonder if they're bringing back in like a George Lucas capacity, like see the way that he was a consultant on the sequels. Just bring him in in that way and just be like, mate, you don't need to do anything, and you don't need to put your name in us if you don't want to, but just oversee it and make sure that it's all going in the right direction. That would make, as a fan, that would make me more comfortable. Yeah, I think because it does I, kind of, it does kind of feel like you're betraying him a wee bit if you do get hyped for this. You're like, ah, oh, yeah, the company that screwed this guy over, like let's go and buy that. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I just I I don't think the only reason I don't think we'll see that is the corporate culture in Japan is not very forgive and forget when there's a fallout like that. Um, mm-hmm. It's it I mean, is much more of a personal matter because your your court your your business and your reputation is like that's everything. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I should specify that both of these leaks, I should specify where they came from, the sources, both of these leaks just came from online leakers. Both of them have been right before. Um, I can't, I've got the name of the Metal Gear guy here. Um, it's Catharsis T. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, the Spider-Man one I've closed. But the it was uh, Daniel something. The two of them have accurately predicted things before. Um, but the third and final one that I think is pretty much set in stone is that there's a Knights of the Old Republic remake being developed. Yeah. Yeah. The reason I think, I think this is... Confirmed. Well, the reason I think it's pretty solid is it's came for Jason Schreier, who is a kind of big deal in the industry when it comes to video game journalism, and I don't see him saying something that isn't going to happen because, again, that's a reputation that he, he doesn't or at least, Or at least it's some, somewhat of a capacity, right? Like, maybe not... You never know, because obviously if it, it could maybe even be further than that. They could maybe remake more than just Knights of the Old Republic and stuff. Like it just... Well, the interesting thing is it's not being confirmed whether it's a remake or a remaster. Remaster, yeah. yeah. Um, it, it could just be a 4K like a paint the way that um, Republic Commando got a few a few weeks ago, or it could be Resident Evil Two style where they completely build the game up from the ground up. Yeah, but again, um, Asport, there's been a wee bit of debate whether it's going to be Bioware who were the original developers, the Mass Effect guys, yeah. um, or it's going to be Asper Media who did the the Republic Commando game that are going to be developing this. I mean, um, I think well, I think it was the Asper team. Ironically, a lot of ex Bioware team members now work for Asper Media so either way it's going to be the original devs that are working on it basically. Do you think, do you think that it's maybe to do like Bioware have that uh, Mass Effect <clears throat> trilogy remaster that's due I think it's already out or it's coming out very soon? Coming out soon yeah. Yeah. I think uh, I think KOTOR is much more ripe for a full on 
remake than Mass Effect is. Um, KOTOR has aged. If you go back and play that game, the mechanics in that game are kind of janky. Yeah. Uh, so I think that the story is great, but it could really benefit from a complete overhaul. Totally. I also think that since in the last few years, the Mass Effect name has been really tarnished and therefore Bioware have been really like tarnished and mm -hmm. yet people still have good faith in KOTOR. I think that still has a good reputation. So they probably don't want to tarnish that more by announcing that Bioware are doing it. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, know, man, I'm, I'm looking forward to Dragon Age Four. I mean, I, it's, yeah. But yeah, that's that's all my leaks. Um, but I just all thought right. it was crazy this week coming in the bear. Yeah, no, it's uh, the games industry. It's just uh, it's like the Titanic. Is that? Just big. I'm not going to continue with that metaphor. Um, <laughs> last piece of news that's going to segue into our next discussion is Invincible has been renewed by Amazon Studios for seasons two and three. Woo! As yeah. if there was any doubt. Uh, was that, but, uh, it was looking tight for a hot minute there when it was, you know, one of the bi biggest showed, uh, streamed shows of 2021. We yeah, could have seen this coming. After the way this season ended, there's, oh, there's no oh, way we don't get, you know, season two. God, I was I was scarred. I've read it before, but I was scarred for life. Okay, so I'm right in saying that immediately after this, we're going to go into a review for the finale, right? Yeah. So a wee bit of confession to make. I've not watched a minute of the TV show. So the way that I thought we could do this, if it's okay with you guys, why should I watch it? Pitch it to me, sell it to me, and go full spoilers. Like I don't care about spoilers. Die batter in. Um, I just I seen it was coming, and I seen the cat. I, I was like, oh, it's, I seen I seen it was an, an invisible show announced, right? And I was like, ah, oh, cool. I like the comic. And then I was like, oh, it's it's animated. It's not live action. Oh, that's you like the comic. Sucky. You like the comic. You like the show. Yeah. yeah. Well, then watch the show. I, that that the, the fact it was animated kind of was about a bum. And then I seen the cast and I was like, oh, I should probably watch this just for the cast. Like, I, I love the actors. And I just, and then it came out and I was like, do you know what? Eh. So, so then, I, I assume we okay, so we're, we'll probably just jump straight into it because I feel like the, the renewal thing was going to happen and, and Kurtman and you put a video about it um, on so, Twitter. And stuff, so so yeah. here's the thing. There's no way they could have done this live action. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. The amount of wanton destruction in this episode puts man of steel to a, to a blushing shame. shame i would um you're you're familiar with the first you know probably omnibus of of this yeah yeah read the omnibus. Yeah, yeah. yeah yeah it's this yeah okay so it is. <laughs> I've you, you, actually sorry to interrupt, but I actually started the omnibus. I've not read all of it. I fell away from it. Oh, poor. I can't um, remember what point. I think I read about half of it. I had it. I had it digitally actually, and, and I read about half of it. Past and just... the point where Omni Man leaves the planet, then you're good. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. It's pretty so, much spot on with what's ha what happens there. Like it's yes. So the the show does reorganize. So the biggest change in the show is in the comic, as I'm sure you know, Omni Man kills the Guardians of the Globe and no one knows he did it and then everyone only finds out when he reveals that he's a big baddie to mark and then beats him up and flies off planet yeah. in the show they draw it out through the season as much more of a mystery where pretty quickly cecil catches on that omni man mm -hmm. did it um debbie mark's mom has more of an arc where she discovers that he did it um, she's also already a real estate agent, which she is not in the comic. She becomes a real estate agent later in the comic is kind of a redemption. Uh, there's, also, um, back together. there's also some people as well who are alive at the end of the main comic that aren't alive at the end of the show. Yes. Okay. So they, they reorganize some events. Um, I think it actually flows better for a show. Yeah. But basically the finale is that final conversation that... Um, Omni Man has with Mark, except it is the the fight that they have, which in the comic is just kind of your typical floating through the air Dragon Ball Z fight uh, mm -hmm. with some emotional undertones, becomes a horror show. It is just it is Omni Man trying to make a point to Mark by horrifically killing 
as many people they basically have their battle in chicago essentially and you you've got uh you've got omni man throwing mark into the street and mark uh like craters his way down the street and throws cars and debris everywhere which kills a bunch of people um a apartment building then starts to come down and he's trying to hold it up and save a couple of people in it fails apartment building comes down he's holding a dismembered arm he's traumatized uh then omni man blasts him down into the subway in chicago and holds him on the tracks while a train is coming and he just the train blasts he just go cuts through the train like a knife through butter you see from his perspective perspective people hitting him and just exploding Exploding. as they hit him nice um yeah, it, it's, it's it's horrible. It's traumatizing. It's I was because I was just flicking through the end of the, the comment there for the Thunderous, and you can tell that they, they definitely wanted the because obviously Cutman was heavily involved in the show, and they wanted to redo this bit, and they wanted to make it as impactful in an animated form, and they done it to fuck perfection, basically. Yeah. Um. And as as Ian said, there's definitely shifts around. Like, um, what's it? Uh, Walter, uh, Walter, who's the guy who I know is like kind of a side character, but like, there's some characters who survive and some who die. Like, oh, they, Donald. D- Donald, that's his name. Donald. Walter. Donald. Um, he survives in the in, at the end of the comic in the first omnibus, and robot still robot at the end of the comic in the omnibus, the volume one. But there's some there's some basically they change some plot stuff around, and as has been said, flows a lot smoother, and. Overall, it probably actually it outpaces the comic, which is a very yeah. tough thing. Yeah, because it's a very fast-paced comic for it to do. Well, and that was kind of Kirkman's thing. Is he's he was ex- I remember reading an interview and he was excited to write the first season of the show because it's been almost twenty years since he wrote the beginning of Invincible, and so he's bringing his you know twenty years of writing experience to bear to mm-hmm. improve the parts of the beginning of Invincible that he thinks he could have done better, which I think is great. Like that's that's really cool that he gets to do that. Um, the Donald thing, I think we're gonna see Donald again um, because in the comic at one point, Donald turns his hand into guns and we find out that Donald is like ninety eight percent robot. He's like a cyborg. So, and he seems pretty human in the show. So, I yeah. think we might see Donald again. Well, you get you can obviously get robot as well. Robot still robot, whereas in this um, spoilers, obviously, uh, he basically takes the blood of uh, Rex Blood, uh, the asshole, and makes a clone of him because robot's actually a giant deformed, fetus super creature. smart, super smart fetus creature inside of a like a containment cage that's keeping him alive and then transfers his consciousness using the, uh, the Moller twins as technology of cloning, mm-hmm. uh, which that by the way, was really well done. Yeah. Really well done. The idea of what it means to be like, who is the actual, like the idea that you can't have, you can't distinguish yourself between yourself and the clone because then that would lead to more problems later on the line. Down the line. Mm-hmm. And the, they, the fact they highlight that as well, they touch on that later in the comic. They touch on that at a point yeah. where um, one of the Mahler twins creates another clone of himself. Once uh, his his clone or you know his whatever um, is is killed, and the Mahler twin that d- makes a new clone, half of his face is like blistered and destroyed from an earlier fight, mm-hmm. and so they know who the original is, and it totally messes with their their uh, their kind of equilibrium. And they end up being like, ah, this is why we do it the way we do it. Because it's a problem if we know who the original is. Um, though here, here's my thought. So they have the same experience up to when they turn on the machine, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But wouldn't they remember which bed they laid the clone down in and which bed they laid down in? Maybe not. Maybe that's the whole thing. It, it scrambles your neurons. Cause yeah, maybe. They, that they was make the a only pl- thing I could yeah. think of is like, when you remember, like, oh, I put the clone in the right bed and I laid down in the left bed. Mm. Uh, Maybe there's like a, a weird swap change kind of bed situation where it's constantly rotating. <laughs> Maybe it's comic books and I just shouldn't be so damn yeah, hard about yeah, it. Maybe you should. Um, but no, um, Dan, it's definitely worth the watch. Um, okay. And and it's all available to binge now. 
Yeah. Um, and you no, know, that, that, that was the other reason I wasn't starting it because I wanted to wait until oh, it was it's, finished. It's so. great. And um, you know, also I'm, the soundtrack I'm, is yeah. super dope. Oh, it's great. Um, and also just the animation's great. Like it definitely has its its flaws. It could be stagnant. It's very stagnant sometimes, and it, and it, it, it arguably the stagnation of sometimes of the way it looks actually works for its benefit because it makes it even look more like a comic book. Mm-hmm. It, it's kind of got the thing you have with a lot of like anime shows where yeah. the less impactful, um, kind of lower lower energy scenes it, are, are a little um, yeah, like a little more still a little bit less dynamic but the fight scene animations are fantastic um especially it's also in the finale pose no punches oh. um like oh. you oh man literally you, you expect them to pull like, be like oh they're not going to do this and then um they just they do it like there's a bit where they mark saves a pilot and he lands on the man's like oh you really bothered to save him and just obliterates his oh. head <laughs> oh, that was bad. So, okay, and I was like, know, ah! <laughs> you know how in the beginning of the comic, Omni Man kills the Guardians of the Globe, and it's like a page long, and mm. most of it's silhouetted anyway. It's like a single panel, and they're just dead. Yeah, yeah. Um, the end of the first episode is that scene. It's whole it five, a, five, ten minutes. Yeah, it's a five to ten minute long fight scene, and it is the most violent. Uh huh. Up until further up ep- at the time, up until further episodes came out, it yeah. was the most violent animated superhero scene i had ever seen yeah i meant to it is like and, it, and it's even and it is very interesting because it, it, it's imagine wives of superman basically the just League went up against superman and and how each of them would try and use their powers and cool. he'd be like huh. <laughs> yeah except yep. uh let's pretend kryptonite's not a thing exactly right because yeah. oh man oh uh, i like I like the the characterization of all the characters in the show, like from your Williams to your Adam Adam Eves, even Rex Boat is a f- asshole, but like endearing by the end. Like even though there's um, like, a lot of side characters, like Black Samson as well as another one, I believe uh, is his name. I can't, I think so. Amber but, can still go right to hell, but that's yeah. Just- Amber's not great. Um, who's she's Mark's love interest for the first season. Um, yeah. It's yeah. <clears throat> potentially part of the second two based on the finale. Yeah, finale, yeah. Um it, it, it's a weird thing because she is like you know how like the same type of thing is like, oh if you know, what why have you been running away? Like you know how the thing we always think of where, you know, surely a superhero's boyfriend or girlfriend would notice if they were running away from stuff constantly. Yep. You know? Mm-hmm. Run away and like disappearing mm-hmm. right when they need She brings it up, she knows that he's invincible, but still yeah. doesn't forgive him. Well, she she figures out he's invisible yeah. and doesn't say anything to him because she keeps expecting him to admit to it, and then and then and is like, angry when he doesn't show up to stuff and when he is like, it's very selfish. Well, and and the thing is, what I realized watching back through the episodes with a friend of mine is we don't really get any scenes where they're actually enjoying their relationship. We get one like non-verbal no. one in the college visit, yeah, but we don't get any real interactions between them where you get the impression that she actually likes him. It's just a lot of her looking at like. It's all of her looking down her nose at him or like turning her back on him and doing a little pouty hmph. And it's like, why would I give a shit about this relationship? They're not pleasant. Like, I have no investment in them keeping this relationship alive. Please break up so he can just get together with Eve. Uh, yeah. Uh, how many of you have a better chemistry in the first season than, um, yeah. than having Amber? Um, like, yeah, honestly, uh, Dan, worth a watch. Um, it's like forty-three minute episodes. So it's like a big, big show, like ten episodes. So like, it's it's good. And honestly, if if you're listening to this and you haven't watched this, this show yet, uh, what are you doing here? Go watch yeah. Invincible. First of all, um, we're gonna have to put a time code in. Yeah, the we are gonna video for spoilers. Uh, we'll just keep in mind it's we start talking about Invincible at about an hour twenty. One twenty. Yeah, one twenty. We'll see. We'll I'll, see what that actually looks like in the final round. Yeah. Yeah. Um. um just code market response because yeah um no you convinced me i'll I'll start it tonight i'm gonna miss having two superhero shows to watch every friday oh man yeah no marvel till for a wee while till june not till loki Uh, that's okay i'll I'll catch up on a lot of reading i'll watch some movies Um, yeah it's all there there's stuff out there there's stuff out there um so yeah invincible watch it it's great the finale was fantastic 
and uh, it ends with um, it ends with uh, Mark on the moon talking to Alan the alien, going, "I guess I'll finish high school," which a lot which, of people predicted was going to be yeah, the ending scene. Which is exactly how the the last page in mm-hmm. the omnibus and that kind of first arc ends. Yep. Um, so let's move on to the main event of the week, which is our weekly discussion topic, and this week. Uh, we floated out the question of favorite non-superhero comics. Now, we covered what that means a little bit at the outset of the show. What we mean by that is no capes, no tights, no flights, no superpowers. Um, I think as long as it's not like a superhero story, magic is acceptable. Yep. Which means uh, Invincible is off the table, unfortunately. Invincible is definitely off the table. Uh, there are a couple of honorable mentions that still wander into superhero territory, but they skate enough away of it. Uh, we've got Punisher Max is very far removed from Marvel's yep. mainline continuity. Yep. Um, I, I've always found that fascinating that they made that decision go in. Like, regardless of what we do with our story, we're not having any Captain Americas or Spider Mans or Wolverine showing up. It's it's going to strictly be yeah. You know, a... The most you get is Nick Fury. Nick Fury shows up and he's a bastard. Yeah, because he's Nick Fury. Uh, yes. <laughs> Garth um, Ennis' Fury uh, is it my personal war or my mm, own war or something? That's I a good so. book as well. Yeah, yeah, good book. Um, Matt Fraction's Hawkeye that we mentioned earlier is. It's technically still a superhero comic, but Hawkeye doesn't wear a cape or have any powers, so he doesn't even have like Batman money. So mm-hmm. I'll allow it, I guess. Um, but you know what? Uh, what y'all really want to hear is you want us to read your words that you said to us back to you uh, in front of an audience. So I'm gonna go through a couple of the Facebook reactions because we actually had some really good engagement when we asked uh, people to give us some ideas. So, which we always appreciate. Um, when we put out a question like that, we want you to answer. We want to know what you think so that we can read your words back to you. So first off, uh, Craig Woods, uh, shout out to the F Sobriety podcast, by the way. Uh, Craig Woods, he said, favorite of all time, Love and Rockets. Uh, literally has something to suit every taste. Buried in there somewhere. My top recommendation for anyone. Not sure if they should get in the comics. So, That also kind of falls into our discussion a few weeks back of good introductory comics. Um, Alan, of course, our our friend and fellow co-host, Alan Todd, uh, agreed with him. Uh, We've got a couple of mentions from Matt Etheridge. Uh, We've got East of West. Uh, He mentions Die. I've heard good things about that. Um, The Wicked and the Divine. I haven't read that. Brilliant. Phenomenal. Uh, he was the one that brought up Matt Fraction's Hawkeye, by the way. Shout out there. Um, Alan, who, again, is not on this week, but I don't want to leave him out. He had many, many <laughs> recommendations. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. A couple of them are actually going to be ones we'll talk about for ourselves. But um, The Sandman was a big shout by him. Obviously, Neil Gaiman and The Endless. Um, again, magic kind of allowed. And that's Vertigo, so it's very, at least... In the outset, it's very removed from the DC universe. They've kind of... Scott Snyder did some things with that. Uh, with Neil Gaiman's blessing. Um, Criminal by Ed Brubacker and Sean Phillips. Or really anything by them, he mentioned. Hell yeah. Um, Hellboy, which... Yeah, I feel sure. like that's right in the precipice of superhero. I yeah. would say Hellboy is as a superhero. Almost there. Hellboy is definitely on the edge. Um, I would say if we're we're counting Constantine, then yes. Yeah. Hellboy is, yeah. Um, More by Garth Garth Ennis. You know, we got got Preacher. Um, Akira, which, uh, yeah, sure. That counts. Manga is comic books. Um, Chu, which uh, there is an interview with John Lehman up that you can listen to to find out more about that. Um. Conan by Kurt Busiek. Uh Really, any Conan is is great. Um, and then some more Sandman stuff. Uh, Rich Young mentioned uh, Persepolis, which I've heard of but never read. Uh, do, 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 do. Got some more mentions about the Wicked and the Divine. 
Somebody, uh, Katie Ingram, mentioned Transmetropolitan, which obviously after everything we've heard about Warren Ellis sucks, but Transmetropolitan is, is great. I've really good, good things about that too. Yes. Um, I really like uh, Neil McCulloch's callouts, uh, especially Calvin and Hobbes by Bill Watterson. Mm-hmm. It counts. It's a comic book. And Garfield by Jim Davis. Yeah. The classic comic strips. I mean, if we're going for that, you know, you've got the Bruins and Orwelly as well, who are uh, classic staples of Scottish Scottish comics. I am completely unfamiliar. Yeah. Um, I'm. We've got Family Circus and Dagwood and yeah, all these kind of. I cool. haven't looked at the funny pages in yeah funny pages comics, yeah. in over a decade. What I used to love, they used to have the uh, the weekly little Spider Man comic strip in my local paper. Um, which was maybe my first superhero comic. Nice. Um, what else we got here? Boy, there were there were a lot of replies. Uh, we got a, a shout out for Strangers in Paradise, which Alan talked about last week from uh, Chris Catherine. Yep. Uh, Angus Latham mentioned Sex Criminals, which I bought the collection of for a friend, and I read the first twenty pages and didn't get further into it. That is not a book for children. Don't give that to your kids. Um, the name is literal. It's not a <laughs> metaphor. Uh, Max, Maximo, Max, Maximo? <laughs> Maximo? Maximo? Maximo uh, Massimo. You gave a shout out to Alex Packendale, which I'm sure we're about to talk about. Yeah, we are. Um, uh, David Crana suggested Scalped. Scalped. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. Really good book. Really good, good book. one. Yeah. Um, let's, let's get into our picks here. So... I have, you, Daniel, you put a couple worth mentions on here, and, and one of them is actually one I wanted to mention. So um, my my kind of biggest one is the entire reason I brought this topic up is I started rereading through Saga um, by Brian K. Vaughn. And that book, is like, as soon as I started reading it again, I was like, oh, yeah, this book. Um I need to read it actually. I've I've only heard good things. Oh, yeah, Saga is incredible. It's yeah, just I've read the first three, I think. Yeah, it's great. It's so good. It's just the characters are great. The world building is fantastic. Um, you really start to care about the characters. There is a lot of this person is a villain, but then they become kind of an ally and switching back and forth, and characters evolve and change. One of the villains uh, falls into a major depressive spree and becomes overweight. Um, which is really funny. It's becoming being depressed and overweight isn't funny, but just the way that they do it is is funny. Yeah. Just to be, I'm not don't get canceled. I'm, don't not, get canceled. I'm not mocking your challenges. All right, we all go to the fridge for some comfort every once in a while. Um, again, it is very much a mature comic. Don't give this one to your kids. There are some explicit scenes in it. So keep that in mind. The literal first scene is one of the main characters giving birth, um, saying the dialogue, it feels like I'm shitting. So <laughs> let that be your baseline. Uh, but the, art, um, the artwork itself is great. though. Oh, the artwork is amazing. It's so good. It makes me jealous as an artist. Most comic book art does. <laughs> um, it's, it's just, it's, it's perfect perfectly fitting to the story and from what i understand the way brian k vaughn has written it he's written it intentionally to be like unadaptable into a movie he wanted it to be a comic book he didn't want it to be like i'm gonna write this and then you know universal is gonna make an adaption hollywood in 10 years i've heard rumors of an adaption (laughs) i mean i mean the way invincible is going i was gonna say do an anime i think it's a television adaption that i was that i was reading about mature animated tv shows are definitely going to be oh yeah Oh yeah, for cost certain comics, uh, which we'll uh, I'll touch on that later. Um, my second thing is Witches by Scott Snyder and Jock uh, on the art duties. Um, I, I read, I bought Witches a couple years ago. I only finally got around to reading it a couple months back. Um, Scott Snyder, before he got onto writing nothing but Batman for his entire life, <laughs> is a really good horror comic author. Yes, yes, and. Witches in particular is a really disturbing take on the idea of witches 
as these creatures that live in the forest that are actually an evolutionary off split from homo sapien, from human beings. Um, they're really messed up looking. They have these long, creepy limbs. Um, their eyes are on the same side of their head like flounders. Um, they live under the forest in dens that you can get to through trees. They kidnap children. And kind of the conceit of it is they have a symbiotic relationship with human beings in that in exchange for doing what they call pledging someone, which is to wipe this gross liquid on them to mark them for being kidnapped and eaten. Um, they offer people power, pretty much whatever they want. Immortality, make someone fall in love with you, make someone forget something. Um, and, and so as the comic goes forward, you find out that this entire town it's set in, pretty much everyone is under the thrall of these witches. Everyone has offered them something. Everyone has pledged someone. Um, I don't want to say too much about it because there really are a lot of twists and turns. Uh, it's it's a really great comic to read around Halloween time. And <laughs> Jock is maybe like Greg Capullo is my favorite artist to pair with Scott Snyder for superhero stuff. Jock is my favorite artist to pair with scott snyder for horror based things his art is just so kind of out there and sketchy and unnerving yeah. um, i actually have a blanket that is if you remember back when scott snyder did black mirror with jock on, on the art um yep. he did a really well-loved cover that was uh just joker's face like bats coming off of it very kind of bat um, signal for eyes Yes. Yeah. I have I have a blanket. I have a little blanket that has that art on it. Like I've I've got, I I've got the poster. Yes, <laughs> I, yeah, I know I know I know exactly what you're talking about, even though so I, I'm not good. super familiar with it. Um so I, yeah, I highly recommend good. witches. And the last one that I would be remiss not to mention, again, this is skating the edge of the superhero thing, is of course the original Vertigo three hundred issue run of Hellblazer. Yeah. There's so much to say about John Constantine. Frankly, if you're listening to a comic book co podcast, I think you know who Constantine is. Um, if I was going to recommend that someone read Hellblazer, I would honestly say start from the beginning. Start from issue one. It's a little weird at first because it did start in the 80s and it's definitely got that feeling of like handwritten letters, a little hard to read sometimes, kind of busy artwork with some sort of 80s coloring. Um, but still really good unsettling stories. What what I love about Hellblazer, like every arc has its payoff if you read it, and there's yes. different writers and arts that work on it. But at, at that said, you can pick up a trade paper park or a few issues and read them and it's its own story. Absolutely. That's that's what I loved about it. If you've read it all, there's there's something at the end of it for you. And if you just want to go in and you pick up trade three or you pick up trade eight, it's it's great on its own. Oh, yeah. That's what I love about that, that whole and, story. As, as um, I guess as stereotypical as it might be, if I was going to recommend someone pick up one trade to read for Hellblazer, it's got to be Dangerous Habits. If you've seen the Keanu Reeves movie, that's a loose adaption of Dangerous Habits. It's the whole uh, Constantine has cancer, he's going to die, but there is so much more that happens in the book. Um, it has so much more of a satisfying ending. Just... A, a timeless story um and the, I mean, the other cool thing about hellblazer is unlike most and this actually is a big differentiator from your traditional superhero fare john constantine ages in real time in the comics so the comic starts in the 80s and ends in 2011 yep. and though he ages slower because he's got demon blood in him spoilers he does age in real time through the series so he does start i think in his um early 30s or maybe late twenties, early thirties, uh, when the series starts at the in the late eighties, yep. and he ends in his fifties. So he does get older. He does age as the comic moves through in real time. And I so also need to. Characters. I need to read. I need to. I do need to read it because I've read the first link. It's the first four, five, ten issues, maybe of it. Oh, it's so good. And it, it was it was really enjoyable, but like it was it was I, I have fond memories of it being my cousins. Mm -hmm. Um, and I read the first few issues. Of his thing, and then I went and saw out kind of the rest of them online and stuff, and yeah. read through them. But I am, um, yeah. And because there's so many authors over the course of that thirty some odd years, it does have its ups and downs. 
Mm -hmm. Um, It has its better arcs and its worst arcs. But I mean, I can't really remember a Hellblazer story was like, man, that really sucked. Like worst case scenario, there were ones where you're like, ah, that was kind of forgettable. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Uh, But those are my uh, those are my picks. Uh, Let's now turn to our man on the street, Massimo the Machine. I don't know why I'm doing this with my arms you can't see if you're only listening audio I'm podcast listeners that ian was waving his arms around he, these are the things that you must when you watch that exactly. like, version gonna watch the uncut version on youtube <laughs> so um, say words now so yeah uh for me i have uh, a few interesting ones as as, as mentioned i i mentioned uh, pat nadel when we were kind of put this kind of survey first out um the book that i uh, kind of picked this a non-superhero one because he has a uh, quite a few um, he's got like Arcadia and Friendo and um, he's got a uh, Giga, which is still ongoing. It's great. Love and there's a review for that one. So. Really good. Um, but the one that I picked is Alex Patadel and uh, Artem, I can't say, I hope you can see his last name, Trakhanov uh, is Tunko, which is basically a story about uh, like aliens came to Earth, lived under a regime for like 300 years, then they all left. Oh no, humanity is in a bad situation now because time. Yeah, there's still like people who like worship these aliens as gods. There's still like like uh there's still like police officers who like the the New York and sitting all certain New York City, the New York police department got split in half, half of them are working for the aliens and half of them are modern cops, like Earth cops. And it's just a really interesting story about, you know, you could obviously have you have all these stories about oh aliens coming to Earth and integrating with human beings. This what is more a story about afterwards. Yeah, what was afterwards and mm-hmm. what are the social, political, psychological influences and it's just a really interesting story where the main character who I will uh what's her, what's her name? Uh God uh I'm gonna it, ah uh, Mar- uh, Marta Gonzalez. She's great, I'm just reading the back of it because uh, it has been a little we hot minutes as I read this because uh, it's like a month or so um, and I've read several comments but phenomenal story some great twists in here and honestly as a kind of like di- something different as you would say from like Serbino comics like a really good kind of five issue kind of individual story mm. just something that's the art is phenomenal by the way it's so grimy so I love it so much it's great what I love about Pattendale man I love how he's such an after the fact storyteller Yes, like he doesn't really yeah. care about the big event. It's like, how did the big event affect, yeah, affect people? Yeah. People in the long run. I think that's such a fascinating perspective. I think yeah. we talked about that a couple weeks back when you mentioned uh, Turncoat for the first time. Is yeah, he has he takes what could be a real also ran run of the mill concept for a comic, mm-hmm. and he really dives into the nitty gritty of of how does this affect society? What's what's the sociological impact here? Not just let's show some cool stuff and don't you want to see aliens i mean it's yes more, i do but like i think it's also more relatable as well because things like the coronavirus now we're like what the long-term effects of that yes. you know things happen yeah. in the world that you're like what are they going to be so that to me is more relatable than here's an alien punching a god in the face like, like you can't I, really relate to that whereas yeah i think i think honestly turner coat is one of those ones that will stand the test of time and will only become more relevant as things go on with the world that we're living in yeah um but honestly uh, and there's also an interview with pat nadell alex pat nadell you can find uh, yes, on we did do an interview with him. We did. Me and Alan did that, and it was Check the phenomenal. Check the site. Check the site. Uh, but yeah, no, uh, it's it's great. And I actually bought for the copy the other day because it was on sale in Forbidden Planet. Uh, nice. But even if it isn't on sale, you should buy this anyway because I read Some the digital worth copy. the money. Some things are worth the money. Uh, okay, and then from that drastic psychological, uh, sociological uh, aftermath story, uh, I have picked, and this was my first probably non com non superhero comic that I ever read. The uh, adaptation of Robert Louis Stevenson's Kidnapped. Hmm. Uh, which is, if you know Robert Louis Stevenson, you know Treasure Island. Yes. Uh, Kidnapped is all about a young boy who gets basically taken away from his family, stolen away a ship. Um, and the the interesting thing about the whole story is it's done in Old Scots. So you, yeah, the whole thing is done in Old, like, okay, away, we shall. Like, like so basically pure, I would read it and be like, yeah, uh, I have no uh, idea. Yes, yeah. saying. Yes, yeah. You'd be even more pr- pretty art though. Um, I don't have that a copy with me because it's probably back at my mom and, mom and dad's house. Uh, but yeah, honestly, for and I feel like this is something that cannot be said enough for young readers who who you want to get into classical and older literature. Mm-hmm. 
introducing them to graphic novel or like illustrated kind of like comic book versions like. of uh, these classical yeah. stories is the best way to do it. Hmm. Um, but Robert Louis Stevenson's Kidnapped is a great story. Um, you know, it's classic, so I can't really say much about it. That hasn't already been said by right. hundreds of other literature credits. I just think it's an interesting way to adapt a comic book into something, uh, adapt a Absolutely. story that maybe people couldn't see as a comic book into a comic book story. Um, and I'll be honest, that uh, that's all I really want to say on that. So my last kind of major thing that's my favorite uh, comic adaptation that isn't superhero-based uh, is Chew. I know we mentioned it earlier on, and as we mentioned, there's a John Lehman interview, but it is honestly the best, like, 10 volumes I read over a 24-hour period in my life. Like, I yeah. couldn't put it down. I read, like, the first 10 volumes of Chew over, like, a day or so, day and a Chew, half. Chew is one of those books that I've not read, and I feel guilty about. Oh, I feel like yeah. I should have read I, it. I hadn't read it. I hadn't read it up until recently, but um, that's because I'm extremely young and I know nothing about comic books. Uh could tell uh <laughs> he's a little, little baby he's our little baby um, boy baby boy um but yeah no uh chew is definitely worth a read daniel again and honestly i i the story gets co- progressively crazier and great and phenomenal and it just it just gets to this point where like everything goes like tits up but it's in the best possible way ever and okay. and it is and and to give you a brief story it's basically about what happens if basically uh, like a, a bird flu wiped out like millions of people because it was caused by chicken. So chicken is now banned. Mm-hmm. But also in this world, people have food related abilities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And um, yeah, like people, I, I, it's so hard to explain Chew. But so, if I recall, because I remember the first time I heard of, of Chew, and this is part of why I feel bad for not reading it, is almost a decade ago. So yes, Massimo, you've been a you would have been a, a, a wee baby, wee baby child. Um, the comicvine.com uh, podcast at the time that I think is long since defunct uh, talked about Chew a lot in its early days and it always sounded really interesting. If I'm not mistaken, the title character solves crimes by eating people. So it's more he solves, well, he ca- he gets, and it's explained throughout the story because I'm, I'm not really buzzed, like he can gain the abilities and memories of people by eating them. Right. So there's a whole there's a whole arc where he is I'm not gonna spoil it, but he's basically force fed a bunch of people. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not great, and he then gains the abilities of them because he's been exposed to them so much. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a really quite funny way they do it. Like it's it is gross and really like very visceral, but it's also like a really That's interesting fun. way. Yeah, it's very fun. Uh, but yeah, no, but there's other cat like there's like that. There's people who like they cook food, can do emotions. There's like a food reviewer who writes a food and then can convey the texture and the flavors. And she writes a really bad review for like a like a two star Chinese restaurant with like an F health rating or whatever. So it just causes people to start throwing up because she has a columnist in like a local newspaper. Huh. Um, like yeah, people can like put memories. It's it's as the story progresses. Like a there's, super yeah. original premise. Yeah, so it's like people with abilities, but not superheroes. Like, there's nobody running about with capes and tights. But um, it's a lot closer to like a cop story and thriller than a superhero story, even though it does draw inspiration from that. That's um, fair. yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, that's me pretty much. I mean, the only one of no, I would probably maybe mention is Alex Automatic, which I've only read recently. Which we have a review, an interview coming up with that guy, Fraser Campbell who uh, is a really good story, and I mentioned it at the start as well, and you should read that as well, or back the Kickstarter, because it's a great first volume. Um, but yeah, no, uh, yeah, that's what I've kind of picked as my kind of kind of top three, top four. I know I kind of went overboard with it, but I panicked yeah. when I found out I was the last, the last one on this podcast. Well, I, I think you handled yourself admirably, uh, and we're running long anyway, so who cares? Daniel? You think you went overboard? Bring us back? home. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, I've got a good few, but I'm only going to detail a few. Um, first couple are horror comics. Um, 30 Days a Night is a phenomenal book. I love the art in that book. And Steve Niles is a genius. We, yeah. Um, the Walking Dead is another one. Again, mm, I've been course. following it for a long time. I... I've, I've got it in compendium form, and I think I'm like yep. that much away from finishing the, the last compendium. Um, I mean, it's great. It's it's as as it's, as you probably know, the artwork is in black and white, but it's very well drawn. the The story has 
a good consistency, but it also has a fair amount of twists. Yeah. Um, yeah, Walking Dead is great. And we already mentioned Hellblazer. That was on my list, but Ian already spoke about that. Um, right. Other than that, I've got Fatal, which, again, I think Alan briefly, briefly mentioned the creative team of Sean Phillips and Ed Brubaker in yes. the Facebook post. Fatal is great, but even better than Fatal, in my opinion, is Criminal. Criminal is a phenomenal series. If you've not read it, you really should. It is very Quentin Tarantino. It is also quite noir. Um, it's it's brilliant. Bad Night, uh, Lolf, uh, yeah, Lawless. There's there's so many volumes. The first volume, Coward, is probably my favourite. But fantastic series. Um, other than that, I have got down. Is V from V for Vendetta a superhero? Does he no. Care? No, no, nah. definitely not. Because definitively, he's an idea. That's what he says. Ideas are bulletproof. So yeah. I figured he was okay. He, like, was he, okay. he technically has a cape and with his weird like cloak right. kind of thing. But you know, and, <laughs> in the movie, powers. It's set in, a in the movie. He was world more world. of a superhero, I think. But in the book, yeah. um, he was very much more of just an idea and a political sort yeah. of mentality. Uh, but yeah, v, v for V for Vendetta is a phenomenal book. Um, timeless, really. Yes, and. Preacher is another timeless book. Again, we were talking about books that were written in the 80s before and some of the artwork might have aged a wee bit, but Preacher's phenomenal. Um, Garth Ennis is a genius and Steve Dillon was a, f- a fantastic artist and absolutely perfect for that story. Um, Preacher's the last... one I've been meaning to read. I've also been meaning to watch the, the TV show. I just haven't gotten around to it. I either. enjoyed the show. I, I watched the first two seasons of the show. I haven't actually read the comic. If you enjoyed the show, the, the comic's a million times better. Like, okay. Far Tends better. Tends to be that way. The, the show's yeah. fine. The show was okay, but uh, yeah, the, the comics like really phenomenal. Uh, and other than that, I've got Sin City, which again we mentioned earlier. Yes. But what what I love about Sin City is it's not really a story about a character about one guy. It's it's very much it's an anthology. And, well, it's in the style of the old noir crime stories that you used to read, where it would just be. It feels like a journey through the city and you're seeing snippets of this yeah. character's life and this event that happens and then you go back and you see the event from a different perspective or it might be beforehand. or, And that's why, like you mentioned earlier, Ian, that there's some highlights in that book and there's some low points, but right. I feel like when you have got when you read the omnibus or the compendium, it's all relevant because it all kind of feeds into each other. I don't really see it as separate stories. I just kind of think of it all as a one, you know, few nights in this city and... Yeah, it's it's a brilliant experience. The artwork is like, phenomenal, uh, and yeah, the the eponymous Sin City is the character. I would I would actually even go out a limb and say it's probably my favorite Frank Miller project. I mean, I I do like Year One. Mm-hmm. I I'm okay on Dark Knight Returns. Um, everything else, well, uh, I do like is Daredevil. To be fair, I do like Born Again. And I do like Man Without yeah. Fear, but. In terms of the artwork and the story, kind of combining, I think Sin City is my favourite, and I also think it's the last great thing he did, personally. Really? Yeah. So um, it's, the, it's the high point of the Frank Miller bell curve. It was. I, I've always said it's a story that drove Frank Miller insane. I think. <laughs> <laughs> like I think, I think writing Sin City finished him. Like yeah. I think, I think September 11th is a story that drove. No, that Frank was Miller insane. Yeah. But... Yeah. <laughs> also, it was just before that year, I guess. But yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's my list. Okay. Those are those are some really good picks. Um, I mean, we're really what this again. Part of the reason I chose uh, this topic was just because I wanted to really wax poetic about Saga because I really love that series. But I mean, really, it just goes to show that just because you might not love the idea of superheroes doesn't mean you can't get into comic books. Um, I know, um, for example, my roommates they think superheroes are silly and that's fine superheroes are silly and they are dumb and you don't have to like them but there's so much more out there yeah in comic books than just assholes what? in tights flying around saving the day yeah. you've got horror you've got crime you've got slice of life like a lot got... of the a lot of the series we mentioned are obviously stuff that is stuff that's finished or stuff that's one-offs and single but there's lots of great ongoing stuff like that as I mentioned earlier, brought to Valley Road, ongoing series, not superhero related, heavily supernatural, done by obviously Grant Morrison. Fantastic. Yeah. Like these aren't just like individual like things like, oh, someone so and so made a non superhero comic. It's one of those things. They they exist and loads of studios out there publish some great work. Absolutely. 
Yeah, and what really surprised me when Ian came up with the question and kind of posed it to us, when I thought about it, I realised, oh my god, most of my favourite comics are non-superhero comics. And I didn't think I was that guy, like, I, I, I like superheroes. But see when see, see this list here, I mean, Mad, if you, you were asking me my top ten, <laughs> Beef or Vendetta would be on it, Criminal would be on it, Preacher would be on it, Sin City would be on it. Do you know what I mean? So there's four. Walking Dead could even be on it. There's oh, yeah. five. Half my list yeah. is non-superhero. <laughs> like, do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, I, I mean, was really surprised at how Judge, many Judge Dredd, 2018. Do you know what I mean? Big, one of the biggest publications of comics in the U, like UK, that kind of magazine. Yeah. Like, you know, like... I mean, it's such a it's such a broad medium. You can really adapt any kind of story to a comic book. And Garth Ennis does a good job as well with non-superhero stuff. As much as I love his superhero stuff, he also yes. makes a good non-superhero story. He certainly does, and he certainly makes some real enjoyable, gross stuff. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I mean, how many times does he appear in us? Like Hellblazer and yeah. uh, Preacher and, yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, is he? Hang on. I mean, when when the thing about Garth Ennis is... Excuse me. Um, when Punish he does do superheroes, it's like willfully mean spirited. You can tell that Garth Ennis hates superheroes. I love the way he writes Wolverine. It's so ridiculous. Yes. Yeah, it's hilarious, man. I think I think that's a great thing though, is that even though superheroes are, as you said, this this silly superheroes and tights and all that stuff, when people take that step back and really meta them and really kind of perform like like this kind of commentary on the superhero genre within it or even kind of adjacent to it it results in like incredible results it results in these heroes that we actually grow to love because of their stupidly like meta nature almost or it results in the boys yes <laughs> that as well yeah um which well, i was actually thinking that see even i was thinking about non-superhero stuff i was like see watchmen and the boys as much as they are clearly cape superhero stories they're kind of a meta commentary on how ridiculous yeah. those stories are so Absolutely. in a way they're not really traditional superhero stories do you know they're, what I mean? they're anti-superhero stories if anything yeah that's <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're, they're both uh blistering critiques on the superhero genre one deep and insightful and the other one has the uh the depth of an eighth grade uh notebook full of liner notes of boobs and oh. I like the boys. Metal albums. <laughs> I think the TV show is great. I haven't read the comics, the but TV I show really... is great. The comic is just like I, I, I like the comic. <laughs> I love the comic, but it is so it's just, so Garth Ennis. It's yeah. so okay. willfully gross. Yeah, so um, lo love sausage is all I have to say. Uh... Love sausage. Um, so next week, uh, next week we're going to be talking about best animated adaptions. So make sure you drop by. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, BGCP Comic Con. Leave us a comment on Twitter uh, or leave us a comment on YouTube. Excuse me, I already said Twitter. Um, let us know what your favorite animated adaptions of comic books are. It can be any comic, superhero, non-superhero, uh, movie, TV show, whatever you like. Uh, we'll put up a post on the Facebook group for you to comment on as well. If anyone and comments to kill and joke, you're banned. <laughs> uh, yeah that uh we will ignore we will ban you from the group and also we'll ignore the you know someone, you will be you'll be banished from life uh so <laughs> someone, someone this week uh posted a a, a smart ass remark on the question of how can there be a best answer for something that's strictly opinion that's how exactly <laughs> if you answer killing joke you're wrong and it's not the best exactly. answer that's how um, so we'll, we'll talk about that next week and read out our, our favorite uh and that's the other thing it's our favorite responses exactly yeah. um our favorite responses on air. And uh, of course, keep an eye out uh, later this week. Uh, we're going to have an interview with Paul Amos coming up um, with Massimo. And then later, uh, maybe this week, maybe next week, there'll also be an interview with uh, Fraser Campbell. Yep. So those will be two so things you can look forward to. Yep. Well, me and Dan, obviously, uh, we interviewed uh, Paul Amos of Assassin's Creed Syndicate and uh, obviously upcoming uh, TV series, Netflix TV series of Subiru's uh, Jupiter's Legacy. Yes, Paul, um, Amos, Paul Amos was a joy to speak to. He we was to to fantastic, and we yeah. can't wait for everyone to see that interview after the embargo lifts, uh, lifts for the show because that's that's what we're running on. I look forward to hearing it, and uh, of course, again, you know, 
do us a favor, won't you, and leave a like. Uh, maybe subscribe to the channel if you're listening on Spotify or any other podcasting service. Leave a, a rating. Unless you hate us, don't leave that one-star rating. You've got better things to do with your lives. And uh, gentlemen, anything else uh, we should be looking forward to? Any any reviews coming up from either of you? I know, Dan, you said you're probably going to do a cyberpunk review. Yeah, that's that's probably not coming for a couple of weeks. I, uh, um, but that's that's week I'll, I'll have stuff up. I'll uh, I'll probably get back in the flow of writing because I've been kind of busy over the past few weeks. But uh, if you watch the site, you might see more once in future go up because I'm continuously reviewing that series. I've got about maybe six issues that I'm gonna have to kind of review. Maybe split them across the several reviews. But uh, it's a great series uh, by Karen Gallen, and, and you guys should read that. It's another great alternative superhero kind of comic. There you go, Somewhat sticking. Good. Sticking kind of with the theme there. Well, yeah. in that case, make sure you check the uh, website for all that and more. Keep an eye out for those interview podcasts coming soon. And we'll see you next week for more comic news, reviews, and interviews from the crazy minds over here at the Big Glasgow comic page. All the best. All the best, guys. Bye. Thank you for listening to Disassembled. You can find more news and reviews on BigGlasgowComicPage.com. And don't forget, you can also find us on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube as BGCP Comic Con. Make sure you also subscribe on the podcast provider of choice for new episodes every week.